health uh, will now uh, come to order. Uh, due to COVID-19, uh, today's hearing is being held remotely uh, and all members and witnesses will be participating uh, via uh, video conferencing. Uh, as part of our hearing, uh, the microphones, uh, as you know, but it's a reminder, the microphones will be on mute to eliminate background noise and members and witnesses uh, will need to unmute your microphone uh, each time you wish to speak. So that's every time. So turn it on when you go to speak, turn it off so that there isn't any background noise when you're not speaking. Documents for the record uh, can be sent to Megan Mullen uh, at the email address that we've provided your staff with, and all documents will be entered into the record at the conclusion of the hearing. The chair now recognizes herself for five minutes for an opening statement. Uh, today, our subcommittee uh, is considering five bills to reauthorize uh, their important public health programs that support and improve the health and well being of children in our country as well as adults. While so much of our subcommittee's focus and work is on the COVID 19 pandemic that has taken the lives of 150,000 Americans, uh, we also have to continue our essential work uh, during the crisis, which means making sure that health programs. Uh, nearing their expiration are continued, that they are improved, and in some cases, expanded. So today we're going to hear testimony on five bipartisan reauthorization bills. Several of these bills uh, support individuals in the fight against cancer. The Creating Hope Reauthorization Act, sponsored by Representatives Butterfield and McCall, help children access pediatric cancer drugs. Pediatric cancer is the number one disease killer of American children, but pharmaceutical companies often avoid developing pediatric cancer drugs because of the very small market and the high risks that are associated with studying and testing drugs for children. The Creating Hope Act uh, provides incentives for the research and development of pediatric cancer drugs by providing the developers with the valuable priority review vouchers, which allow the recipient to speed up the FDA review of any one of its new drug products. The next bill, the Transplant Act, uh, sponsored by Representatives Matsui and Bilirakis, helps those with blood cancers like uh, leukemia and lymphoma to be matched with a potential bone marrow and cord blood donor. Uh, through this matching program, over 100,000 lives have been saved. So clearly this works. Uh, and that uh, uh, law is the source of pride to all of us. The early act uh, sponsored by representatives Wasserman Schultz and Brooks increases funding for the successful CDC outreach and education campaign that informs young people about breast cancer risks. Uh, each year, over 300,000 women are diagnosed with breast cancer. I've spent my entire service in Congress to make sure women have access to breast cancer treatment, including reconstructive surgery uh, after mastectomies. And I'm really pleased to consider this important uh, program today. Now, outside of public health programs that help in the fight against cancer, we're also considering a bill to reauthorize the school-based health center program sponsored by Representative Sarbanes and Stefanik. About 2,500 school-based health centers serve 3.6 million American children. These health centers provide children with immunizations, mental health support, asthma and allergy screenings, and many other vital services. It's a, it really is a terrifically effective program. And finally, we're considering a bill to make sure that the U.S. anti-doping agency is prepared for the 2028 uh, Olympics in Los Angeles. The sponsors are Representative Mike Thompson, Diana DeGette, and Mr. Johnson. The agency is an independent body that manages the anti-doping program for America's athletes uh, to ensure they're playing clean. So as we struggle with the uh, pandemic, with COVID-19 and the crisis that it is in our country, we have to keep up our work 
for the American people, those with cancer, our nation's children, and our athletes training for future events. And that's exactly what we're doing today. So I stand ready to work with each of you to make sure that these programs are reauthorized. Uh, and with that, I will uh, yield back my time. And uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Dr. Burgess, the ranking member of our subcommittee for five minutes for his opening statement. And uh, please remember to unmute. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, very well, I thank the chair. I I trust I've successfully unmuted. Uh, it's an important hearing today to discuss uh, the reauthorization of five public health programs, the school-based health centers, the Young Women's Breast Health, Breast health Education and Awareness, uh, the Stem Cell and Therapeutic Research Act, and the United States Anti-Doping Agency Reauthorization Act, and perhaps most importantly, the Pediatric Priority Review Voucher Program. All five of these bills provide tools for individuals in all stages of life to stay healthy and to save lives. So I'm grateful that the committee has organized this discussion on these important measures of expiring reauthorizations and potentially providing hope and reassurance to many Americans in what has turned out to be a very difficult time. Often serving as a lifeline for access to care to many children, HR 2075 would reauthorize federal support for school-based health centers while also including federally qualified health centers as eligible providers, generally administered as a partnership between hospital schools and local organizations. School-based health centers provide comprehensive care for students through important services, such as primary medical care, behavioral care, and even substance disorder counseling. These services are offered in school, a setting with which students are familiar and comfortable, this convenient setting makes these services more accessible for many students, especially those high risk, and certainly underscores the importance of opening schools. Furthermore, ensuring access to preventive care allows for early intervention and treatment before a condition might worsen. This was first authorized in 2010. The early act reauthorizes the young women's breast health education and awareness requires learning young act. This piece of legislation provides women with more meaningful information teaching women, especially young women, the importance of breast health and the risk factors associated with breast cancer, education awareness, and the critical steps in preventive care. With a history starting in the 1980s, the CW Bill Young Cell Transplantation Program has supported over 92,000 blood stem cell transplants with 12,000 Americans diagnosed with blood cancer and disorder every year. H.R. 4764, the Transplant Act, would reauthorize the C.W. Bill Young Transplantation Program and the National Core Blood Inventory, providing resources and support to those who need a donor or a cord blood unit. Diseases like sickle cell anemia or blood cancer often rely on bone marrow or cord blood transplant for treatment. However, 70% of those with a blood disorder or cancer do not have a matched donor. H.R. 4764 will help maintain that program. And I do want to acknowledge over the years, this uh, program has been one that has been championed by Representative Chris Smith of New Jersey. And certainly he has been responsible for getting us to where we are today with the cord blood industry. In 1999, the US Olympic Committee launched the United States Anti-Doping Agency to oversee and enforce anti-doping programs for our nation's athletes. The Anti-Doping Agency Reauthorization Act would ensure that the USADA has the resources needed to encourage healthy sportsmanship among American athletes, especially as sports teams begin playing again. Our athletes often serve as role models for our children, making the mission of USADA all the more significant. Our children must learn the value and importance of clean sportsmanship. Parenthetically, it's interesting that in 2014, one of the earliest attacks of Russian interference was in the anti-doping agency that was uh, actually administered through what it turned out to be the, uh, uh, the Russian military. I'm Finally, I'm encouraged to see H.R. 4439, the Creating Hope Reauthorization Act, including included in today's hearing. It's an important a bill that would make permanent the Pediatric Rare Disease Priority Review Voucher Program, an incentive program to encourage American drug innovation for rare and pediatric diseases. Because of the complexity and expense required to invest in pediatric drugs, the FDA had only approved two pediatric oncology drugs in 22 years leading up to the Creating Hope Act. 
which was first signed into law in 2012. Since the enactment of this program, the FDA has approved 22 drugs. Unfortunately, the program does expire in September 30th of this year, so it does require our immediate attention. So I hope we can continue to work on these bills in a bipartisan manner and get these reauthorizations across the finish line. They're all critical. I thank our witnesses for sharing their time and expertise today, and I will yield back the balance of my time. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't hear Anna. Am I um, supposed to speak now? Yes, I just oh. introduced you. All right, thank you. You should vote on that. So today we continue the committee's ongoing work to improve the health and well-being of Americans by discussing legislation that will reauthorize five important public health programs while we continue to prioritize the critical response to the COVID-19 pandemic that is devastating our nation. It's also essential that we continue our work to improve access to care. So we're gonna hear from public health experts about what is working and what considerations this committee should take into account as we move forward on the five bills. Um, I know that, uh, Chair, Chairwoman Eshoo has already described the bills, but let me just say a little more about them. The first bill, H.R. 2075, the School-Based Health Centers Reauthorization Act, authored by Representative Sarbanes, Tonko, and Upton, would reauthorize these centers. And those health centers are a powerful tool for achieving health equity among children and adolescents who unjustly experience disparities in outcomes because of their race and family income. And the authorization for school-based health centers lapsed in 2014, and it's important that we strengthen those programs with additional federal funds. The next bill, H.R. 4078, the Early um, Act reauthorization, that was introduced by uh, Representatives Wasserman, Schultz, and Brooks, and it authorizes the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to develop initiatives to increase knowledge of breast cancer among women, particularly for women under the age of 40, and those at heightened risk for developing the disease. Uh, breast cancer, we know, has impacted too many families, and it's important that the CDC continue its work. We're also going to bring up H.R. 4439, the Creating Hope Reauthorization Act, co-sponsored by many members of the committee. This bill would permanently authorize the Rare Pediatric Disease Priority Review Voucher Program. Uh, this program has provided value to, to pharmaceutical companies who've made investments in rare disease programs, but it's also placed as a strain on the FDA. So we have to keep in mind uh, that we should think carefully about whether a permanent authorization uh, makes sense as opposed to shorter term. Next, uh, H.R. 4764, the Transplant Act of 2019, reauthorizes the C.W. Bill Young Transplantation Program. This provides patients who need life-saving bone marrow and umbilical cord blood transplants with info and support as they go through the process. It also maintains an efficient process for identifying donor matches, increases the number of non-familiar donors available for transplant, and expands data and research uh, to improve patient outcomes. Uh, our colleagues Matsui and Bill Arrakis have authored this and worked to secure funding for this program for many years. And finally, the uh, H.R. 5373 U.S. Anti-Doping Agency Reauthorization Act. Uh, the Anti-Doping Agency is the national organization in the U.S. for Olympic, uh, Paralympic, Pan American, and Para Pan American sports. And this reauthorization will not only promote clean sports through testing, education, and research, but also use a portion of its funding to promote a positive youth sport experience. So I want to thank all the witnesses, and I'd like to yield uh, the time that remains to Representative Sarbanes. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Chairman Pallone. I want to just thank Chairwoman Eshoo, Chairman Pallone, uh, for having this very important hearing today uh, regarding reauthorization of all these key public health programs. I have been working on the school-based uh, Health Center Reauthorization Act for uh, a very long time, and I'm very appreciative that that is a bipartisan bill. And we certainly have bipartisan sponsorship of it within uh, the committee, and it would authorize, as you've indicated, federal support for school-based health centers through 2024, um, which provide critical primary and mental health services to vulnerable and youth um, certainly very 
uh, important in this moment. I've seen it in Maryland uh, for sure, and, and I know that the witness we have today, Robert Boyd, who's president of School-Based Health Alliance, uh, will certainly be able to testify uh, to this as well, and that is that when a student has access to school-based health centers, the negative health outcomes such as asthma, morbidity, rate of hospital admissions, those decrease while the educational outcomes such as school performance and graduation rates increase. Um, and now, of course, the services of school-based health centers are needed more than ever given the coronavirus uh, pandemic. Uh, young people grappling with changes in their lives, the uncertainty, and being able to get care in a familiar and supportive setting is, is very important. So look forward to the testimony today. Again, thank you, uh, Chairwoman Eshoo, uh, Chairman Pallone, and my colleagues uh, for support of this bill, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the chair uh, now has the pleasure of uh, recognizing Mr. Walden, uh, the ranking member of the full committee, for his five minutes uh, for an opening statement. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thanks for having this hearing. Uh, as, as we've heard, these are really important pieces of legislation. I'm glad we're having the hearing on them. Um, obviously, there's a lot of uncertainty about uh, the authorizations as they're due to lapse or expire in just a matter of months. So reauthorizing the funding of these public health programs could be literally life-saving for Americans. And because of that, it's critical that I, I hope we swiftly move these bills. As we've heard, the first bill, H.R. 2075, the School-Based Health Centers Reauthorization Act of 2019 by Representative Sarbanes, Upton, Tonko, and others, reauthorizes funding for school-based health center programs which support health centers operating as a partnership between a school and a community health organization in order to provide quality health care uh, for our students. H.R. 4078, the Early Act Reauthorization of 2019, sponsored by Representatives Wasserman, Schultz, and Brooks, uh, reauthorizes programs related to breast cancer outreach, of which you've been a real leader, Madam Chair, on, on this effort, and other education initiatives, along with survivor support services at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. H.R. 4764, the Transplant Act of 2019, spearheaded by Representatives Matt Sui and Bill Arrakis, uh, reauthorizes the CW Bill Young Cell Transplantation Program that provides critical support and life-saving treatments to patients in need of bone marrow or umbilical uh, blood uh, cord transplants. There are approximately 7,000 rare diseases uh, affecting an estimated 30 million people. It's also estimated about half of these diseases affect children. That's why I'm glad that we're also considering H.R. 4439, the Creating Hope Reauthorization Act. This bipartisan legislation makes the Priority Review Voucher Program permanent for rare uh, pediatric diseases. The PRV was first created in 2012 with the passage of the Food and Drug Administration Safety and Innovation Act to incentivize the development of therapies to treat rare pediatric diseases. While progress has been made in the development of pediatric therapies, in fact, 22 therapies have been approved for the treatment of 18 rare pediatric diseases since the inception of the pediatric, pediatric PRV program. We all know we still have a long way to go. Nearly 95% of all rare diseases do not have an FDA-approved treatment, leaving many patients and their families with no options. Research and development for rare disease therapies is often scarce because each drug is only intended to serve a very small population. And of course, the opportunity to recoup investments is limited. Drug development is extremely costly, as we all know. It's often uh, time intensive and often requires billions of dollars and nearly a decade before receiving FDA approval if it makes it all the way through the process. The paramount, uh, and uh, I'm sorry, the permanent reauthorization of the pediatric PRV a uh, program would provide some certainty to drug developers considering whether the best in therapies for rare pediatric diseases as they evaluate the feasibility of devoting significant resources to products that may not provide a return on significant investments given the limited population of patients, but that could be life-changing for those that receive them. So again, I want to thank all of our witnesses for participating in our hearing today, and I want to thank the chairwoman for having this hearing and, and helping move these bills along on common sense. They're bipartisan, um, and we hope to get them through the markup quickly and uh, on down to the White House. So with that, Madam Chair, I yield back the balance of the time. Uh, uh, the chair thanks the ranking member for his uh, good comments. 
uh, and he yields back. The chair would now like to remind members that pursuant to committee rules, all members written opening statements uh, shall be made part of the record. Uh, I now would like to introduce our witnesses that are with us today. First, Ms. Linda Blunt. Uh, she is the president and CEO of the Black Women's Health Imperative. Uh, welcome to you. We're thrilled that you're here with us today. Mr. Robert Boyd, uh, the president of the School-Based Health Alliance. Uh, thank you, Mr. Boyd, for your um, uh, willingness to uh, testify today. Uh, Ms. Nancy Goodman, uh, she is the founder and executive director of KIDS um, uh, v. Cancer. Thank you for your extraordinary work, and we're thrilled to have you as a witness. And Dr. Aaron uh, um, uh, Kasselheim, he's the professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Welcome, doctor, uh, and thank you for uh, your willingness to be here with us. Uh, Mr. Brian Lindbergh is the Chief Legal Officer and General Counsel of the National Bone Marrow Donor Program. Welcome to you. And uh, Travis Tigart is the Chief Executive Officer of the U.S. Anti-Doping and Industry uh, uh, Agency. Uh, excuse me, <laughs> agency. So uh, welcome to each one of you. Thank you for uh, being willing to share uh, your time, your important time with us on these important bills. Uh, I now will uh, recognize uh, Linda uh, Blunt. Uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, and please remember to unmute. Welcome you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Chairwoman Eshoo, Ranking Member Burgess, members of the Committee on Energy and Commerce. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before this committee to discuss the Early Act reauthorization of 2019, introduced by Representatives Wasserman, Schultz, and Brooks. I'm testifying today as President and CEO of the Black Women's Health Imperative, and this week we celebrate our 38th year as the only national organization solely focused on improving the health and wellness of our nation's 21 million Black women and girls. We are proud to work with Congresswoman Robin Kelly, that Clark and Lisa Blunt Rochester, members of the Congressional Black Caucus and of this committee. In this role, and as a Black woman, I see every day how young Black women are disproportionately impacted by this terrible disease. And I know we can do more to prevent needless suffering and death from breast cancer through early education and screening. Black women develop breast cancer on average five to seven years younger than white women. And until recently, the good news was that black women got breast cancer at lower rates than white women. But as of 2015, that is no longer the case. But that's where the good news ends. Black women are 40% more likely than white women to die of breast cancer. This is in part for three reasons. First, black women are more likely than other racial and ethnic groups to have an aggressive breast cancer subtype. Second, they are less likely to receive the most effective therapeutics for their cancers. The first is an issue of biology, and the second is an issue of behavior. The third reason is why we're here today. Black women die at such high rates because their breast cancers are too often detected at late stages when treatment of any kind is less effective. And researchers know that most breast cancers are detectable long before a woman gets a mammogram. Consider that 30% of all breast cancers in black women occur under the age of 50, 18% occur under the age of 45. The CDC projects that for this year, roughly 30,000 breast cancers will be diagnosed in women under 45. That's 5,000 among black women under 45. We know that early education, awareness, and screening saves lives. When breast cancer is detected early, and quality treatment is received, the five-year survival rate is 100% for all women. If we just increase the rate of screening mammography by 50% among women 45 and under, the survival rate would be increased by an additional 3,000 women every year, and that's 700 to 1,000 more black mothers, daughters, and sisters. That's good news. 
Younger women are less likely to undergo breast cancer screening than women aged 50 to 74. And they are less likely to have access to the late, latest digital breast screening technologies, including 3D tomosynthesis, which have been shown to detect breast cancers earlier. We must do better to educate and improve access, which is where the early act comes in. The early breast cancer education and awareness requires learning young act sponsored by representatives Wasserman Schultz and Brooks would reauthorize and increase funding originally authorized in 2010, giving needed attention to the education of younger and high risk women about their breast health. The program not only educates women ages 45 and younger on breast cancer risk, but it supports initiatives and research to identify high risk women, collect family histories and educate healthcare providers. The early act has already benefited women. Mortality rates from breast cancer have dropped in the past 10 years, in large part due to early detection. The need for earlier screening and diagnosis is critical for women with inherited genetic mutations such as BRCA genes, Ashkenazi Jewish women, and women who were treated with radiation therapy for cancer as children. I add black women to this list, not because of biology or genetics, but because of the systemic racism that has limited their access to preventive care. The COVID-19 pandemic is yet another example of disparities in our public health approach to the black community. Black people are at much higher risk of contracting COVID-19 and they are much more likely than white people to die from the virus. We're on the verge of a seismic shift in this country when it comes to valuing black lives and health. I see a future when we can stop talking about how black women disproportionately and needlessly die from breast cancer. Reauthorize the early act and make 2020 the year we do what we know works and save lives. Thank you. Thank you very much for your excellent testimony, Ms. Blunt. Uh, I now, uh, the chair now recognizes uh, Mr. Robert Boyd. Uh, you are recognized for five minutes for your statement. Thank you, Chairwoman Issue. Good morning uh, to you and to Ranking Member Burgess and to members of the Health Subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to speak re with you this morning on HR 2075. I'd like to thank Congressman Sarbanes for being the tireless champion for school-based health centers. Without your leadership and your dedicated staff, we wouldn't be here today. My name is Robert Boyd and I am the son and nephew of public school teachers. I'm here today as the president of the School-Based Health Alliance a nonprofit organization based here in Washington, D.C. Since 1995, the Alliance has served as the national voice for more than 2,500 school-based health centers that collectively provide health care for over 3.6 million children, youth, and others from primary, predominantly low-income families from across the country. School-based health centers have been located in public schools since the early 1970s. As you all know, schools are more than just places of learning. Schools are pillars of the community, whether located in large cities, suburbs, or rural America. For millions of low-income students, school-based health centers are their sole source of health care. They allow parents to remain at work and students to stay in school while getting the health care that they need. Now, the data is clear. Healthy kids learn better. Healthy kids earn higher grades, and healthy kids achieve higher promotion and graduation rates. Healthy kids also grow up to be healthy adults. School-based health centers sit at the critical intersection of education and health care. Currently, we hear extensive discussion about how schools will operate this fall. It'll be difficult to safely resume in-person learning. Many schools will continue remote learning or in some hybrid combination. But what cannot be up for debate is the ability of school-based health centers to continue providing essential health care services to our most vulnerable students. Many people do not realize it, but even during the pandemic, many school-based health centers are still delivering ongoing care. Throughout the pandemic, school-based health centers have continued to provide health services to K-12 students directly, sometimes on site at the school, sometimes at school link clinic, clinics, via mobile vans, even drive-through visits in school parking lots. Some students have been able to receive life-saving medications, immunizations, and even participate in socially distanced counseling sessions. Unfortunately, far too many have not. We also provide care through telehealth services. As a result of the pandemic, the U.S. Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services 
has given state Medicaid programs increased authority and flexibility to expand telehealth services, including telephonic and video conference care, and has removed some cross-state licensing requirements. Going forward, telehealth will remain an important strategy for increasing access to care, allowing us to reach the students and families with the greatest needs, including almost one-third of school-based health centers located in rural communities. Telehealth is not a substitute for in-person care. It's a technological enhancement in the tool chest of healthcare providers. Ladies and gentlemen, please be clear. The School-Based Health Alliance believes in a comprehensive definition of health that includes protecting the mental, emotional, and social health needs of students. Even as education and health leaders are urgently purchasing hand sanitizer and masks, we cannot forget to care for the entire student. We are here to help. The mental and emotional health of students is an issue that has too often been overlooked in the current debate about reopening school buildings. It is more important than ever that we think comprehensively and act with urgency. We must treat this pandemic as we would a mass incident like tornadoes, hurricanes, or school shootings that wreak multiple levels, levels of havoc on an entire community. As with a mass incident, some of the pandemic's harm is visible and immediately apparent, but other damage may be less visible, such as increases in depression, anxiety, sleep problems, hunger, and stress called by, caused by children's struggles with online learning and social isolation. isolation. A lingering concern is the potential for child abuse to remain unchecked, given that the primary reporters of violence and neglect are educators and healthcare workers. Communities need maximum flexibility to ensure that the doors of school-based health centers, both our literal doors as well as our virtual online gateways, remain open to deliver critical primary and mental health care services to students. By passing the Bipartisan School-Based Health Centers Reauthorization Act, you will recognize the critical role that school-based health centers play in both the immediate and long-term health needs of our nation's school children. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Boyd, for your excellent uh, testimony. Uh, the chair now recognizes Ms. Nancy Goodman uh, for five minutes for your testimony. Uh, welcome again, and thank you. You need to unmute. More successful. Thank there you. you are. My name is Nancy Goodman, and I'm here as founder and executive director of Kids v. Cancer, a nonprofit that has been the driving force of the Creating Hope Act, as well as the Race for Children Act, which requires novel therapies to be studied in children's cancers. Kids v. Cancer promotes programs that are in the best interest of serious children, regardless of whether the pharmaceutical industry supports or opposes them. Toward that end, we do not accept donations from drug companies. In addition, I have drafted and am solely responsible for the following comments. I am here not only in my capacity as the executive director of Kids v. Cancer, but also as a mother. More than a decade ago, I lived in Manhattan with my husband and sons, Jacob and Benjamin. When Jacob was eight years old, he began waking up with nausea and headaches. We went to our pediatrician again and again. And on a Sunday morning, sitting on an examination bed, wearing a Mickey Mouse tie, our pediatrician told us Jacob might have a brain tumor. We learned Jacob had medulloblastoma, a rare pediatric cancer. The drugs available to treat Jacob were 40 years old and they were unlikely to work. How could that be, I wondered, when there are so many exciting innovations in adult cancer therapies? Jacob died in the early hours of a wintry Friday morning. He was 10 years old. That day I founded Kids v. Cancer. We started with drafting the Creating Hope Act. The challenge we sought to address was that there were an inadequate market incentives to bring drug companies to develop drugs to children with life-threatening illnesses. Yet we wanted to create a program largely funded by major pharmaceutical companies. So let me repeat that. The Creating Hope Act basically transfers value from large pharmaceutical companies to smaller and oftentimes more innovative biotech companies to facilitate their investment in creating drugs for seriously ill children. Since the passage of the Creating Hope Act, the pediatric voucher program has been very successful and has created a pathway 
for companies to develop many drugs for children with life-threatening illnesses. So let me um, review some of these measures of success. The first measure of success is the value of the vouchers. The pediatric voucher program has mobilized well over $1 billion in incentives in the form of payments for vouchers, creating opportunities for market-based, risk-adjusted returns on investment in rare pediatric disease drug development. A second measure of success is the number of new drugs that have been approved for seriously ill kids since the Creating Hope Act's packet, passage, more than 20 so far. A third mark of success is the number of drugs in the development pipeline. As measured by the number of rare pediatric disease designations, this number is increasing by leaps and bounds from three in 2013 to over 60 today. Fourth, as Dr. Kesselheim, my co-witness notes in his health affairs article, drugs qualifying for a pediatric voucher are more likely to proceed through the phases of drug development and, this, and, and at the speed at which it would do so. Fifth, and perhaps the most important, at the time of Jacob's illness, there were no companies whose core mission was pediatric cancer drug development. Now there are several. The Creating Hope Act has been a great success, but its short duration has created uncertainty and limited its impact. Since 2012, the program has been reauthorized three times, each for one to four years. However, this time horizon for drug development from idea to FDA approval can be seven to 10 years or longer. The start of the drug development process, process is a critical moment. It is when developers choose whether to develop a drug for kids. If we reauthorize the pediatric voucher program on a permanent basis, we can affect this early stage of drug development as well. The Creating Hope Act has, created, has increased the number of reviews in the FDA's priority review program. That is why when originally drafting the Creating Hope Act, we were careful to include a provision by which the FDA could compensate itself for any additional burden, allowing the FDA to set voucher user fees. In 2020, voucher user fees are $2.1 million on top of a $2.9 million user fee. If there are remaining issues around the management program, management of this program, I thank the FDA leadership as they work to address them head on so that we do not have to abandon or shorten a program that promises hope to so many critically ill children. All evidence available indicates that the pediatric voucher program is effective. I urge you to support its permanent reauthorization by passing the Creating Hope Reauthorization Act. Thank you for including me in today's hearing and I am happy to take your questions. Thank you very much. Uh uh, Ms. Goodman, uh, I can't help but think that, uh, you know, as a mother myself, out of the extraordinary tragedy and loss of your son, uh, your work is nothing short of remarkable. And uh, uh, it's, um, it's so important for us to take up this reauthorization and that it be made uh, permanent, uh, as you indicated. So thank you very, very much your source of inspiration to us. Uh, next, uh, uh, Dr. A um, Aaron uh, Kesselheim, uh, you are recognized for five minutes for your testimony and thank you again uh, for your willingness to be with us today. Uh, thank you. Chairman Manishu, Ranking Member Burgess, members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to talk today. I'm an internal medicine physician and lawyer and I lead the program on regulation, therapeutics and law one of the largest and most prolific non-industry funded research groups in the country that focuses on the pharmaceutical market. My remarks today will cover the rare pediatric disease priority review voucher or PRV, why it is a poor way to support research into rare pediatric disease treatments and what some better options are. A PRV entitles drug makers to speed FDA review of the 10 month time frame it, it applies to standard drugs that lack any sort of special innovative or clinical qualities to the priority review six month time frame reserved for drugs representing therapeutic advances like those meeting unmet medical needs. Economists assume that drug makers would value reaching the market four months sooner, so Congress created the voucher in 2012 to stimulate investment into rare diseases affecting children, unquestionably an important public health issue. Unfortunately, it hasn't turned out that way. There are four major problems. It doesn't work, 
It wastes public and FDA resources, it is potentially dangerous, and it isn't very valuable. First, from 2012 to 2018, the FDA awarded 14 rare pediatric disease PRVs, which is more treatments than in years before 2012. But the important question is whether the initiation of the PRV program changed the research trajectory. To study this question, in a study led by my colleague here at Harvard, Thomas Wang, we compared how drugs treating rare pediatric diseases progressed through development in the years before and after the voucher program with drugs treating rare adult diseases, which would not earn a voucher. We found no variation in the rate at which drugs eligible for a rare pediatric PRV were introduced into clinical testing. That is, the baseline trajectory didn't change. Rather, there has been an increase in recent years in rare diseases of all kinds, pediatric and adult. That's obviously great, but it doesn't mean that the PRV works, and I'd be happy to submit this paper for the record. Second, the voucher wastes public resources. It derives its market value from the prospect that manufacturers with more likely run-of-the-mill drugs would come to market sooner and start selling those drugs at high prices to be reimbursed with payers by payers like Medicare and Medicaid. It also wastes regulatory resources. FDA officials have raised concerns that the PRV interferes with the way it prioritizes drugs by hastening review of unremarkable products that would not otherwise merit an expedited timeline, straining resources since the FDA cannot quickly hire and train new staff with the necessary expertise to review the drugs. Third, the, the voucher is dangerous since too speedy FDA review may lead to bad decision making. For drugs that are a major advance in treatment, accelerating FDA review is reasonable. But one study showed the risks of imposing arbitrarily short deadlines on FDA review times for drugs that did not deserve such acceleration, such as increased risk of subsequent safety-related withdrawals or boxed warnings. And finally, the voucher's value has plummeted. Because vouchers can now be earned for FDA-approved drugs for neglected tropical diseases and medical countermeasures, as well as rare pediatric diseases, there are a lot of vouchers available on the market. In recent years, vouchers have sold for approximately 80 to $110 million a far cry from the lofty values predicted by the economists who devised this scheme. One way to try to address these issues would be to make necessary improvements in the voucher program. For example, drugs qualifying for the voucher could be limited to first-in-class products or products meeting unmet medical need. Manufacturers should also not be allowed to earn a voucher immediately for drugs approved via the special accelerated approval pathway, since accelerated approval drugs have not yet demonstrated meaningful patient benefits. Most importantly, rare pediatric disease manufacturers earning a voucher should be required to ensure that the product is sold to U.S. patients at value-based prices or at no higher than prices sold to rare pediatric disease patients in other high-income countries to help ensure that the children who need the drug can be assured of access to it. A better pathway forward for Congress would be considered to consider more direct ways of encouraging drug development for such medical conditions. For example, the U.S. government supports pharmaceutical innovation with substantial amounts of taxpayer dollars each year, mostly through the NIH. One study found that all new drugs approved from 2010 to 2019 or their molecular targets could be linked back to this government-funded research. The U.S. government also offers various tax concessions and refunds directed at research and development spending by private firms. Thus, greater upfront funding or tax credits could be offered for research into rare pediatric diseases. And unlike the PRV, this method of stimulating innovation has a track record of success. Another approach would be to provide greater support for late stage development, perhaps through nonprofit organizations via public private partnerships. Recent funding through BARDA to support vaccines for COVID 19 is related to this model. Naturally, such partnerships should include guarantees about affordable access to the rare pediatric disease drugs that emerge because of the public's involvement in reducing the risks and costs of drug research and development. Children with rare diseases need more investment in scientific discovery and clinical trials to get them the treatments that they deserve. It is time to move past this, the pediatric rare disease priority review voucher mistake and let it sunset, and instead direct efforts towards better solutions known to lead to transformative drugs, including direct pediatric and uh, direct public investment in research and development for treatments for rare pediatric diseases. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, doctor. Uh, now we um, will recognize uh, Brian Lindbergh. Uh, thank you again for uh, being with us today. Uh, and you have five minutes uh, for your uh, testimony. Where is Brian? Are you unmuted, Brian? You need to unmute. 
Chair, uh, Madam Chair, I wonder if I'm yeah. having tech problems. Are you able to hear? Yeah, yeah. now we are. And Thank welcome you so much. to you. I apologize for uh, the tech issue there. That's all right. So, That's okay. Ma <laughs> Madam Chair, Ranking Member Burgess, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, I'm Brian Lindbergh. I have the honor to serve as Chief Legal Officer and Chief Policy Officer of National Marrow Donor Program, Be The Match. For over three decades, through public-private partnership with the federal government, we've been entrusted to operate the CW Bill Young Cell Transplantation Program, which provides life-saving bone marrow and umbilical cord blood transplants to patients in need. As you know, this is the program that houses the National Registry of Volunteer Bone Marrow Donors, as well as the National Cord Blood Inventory and the Stem Cell Therapeutics Outcomes Database. On behalf of the entire team at NMDP Be The Match and the patients we serve, I'd also like to thank all of the members of the Health Subcommittee for the opportunity to speak with you today and for allowing me the privilege to share with you the successes of the program over the past five years, but more specifically during the current crisis of the global pandemic. Finally, I'd also like to extend my special thanks to Congresswoman Matsui and Congressman Bilirakis for their leadership in introducing HR 40, 4764 to reauthorize the program for another five years. Mrs. Matsui and Mr. Bilirakis have been tireless champions for patients whose only chance at life is bone marrow transplant. Today, I'm so pleased to be able to tell you that this past December, NMDP Be The Match marked the 100,000th time it facilitated a transplant in which a heroic volunteer donor stepped up to save the life of a person they had never met by making this life-giving gift of bone marrow donation. This is because 35 years ago, the founders of our program refused to accept the conventional wisdom that a national registry wouldn't work because after all, who would do this? Who would step up to donate their marrow for a stranger? They persevered because they knew that a national registry would work, that it must work and needed to be established by Congress. I can say without hesitation that this same spirit, that refusal to take no for an answer, have served this program well over the past year. In addition to celebrating our 100,000th transplant in 2019, we have facilitated more transplants than any other year in our history. And then global pandemic arrived, and it threatened the very foundational underpinnings of our ability to fulfill our obligation to those patients. And that's specifically why I'm here before you today. As you're no doubt aware, the success of this program and the lives of the patients we serve rely on our ability to move couriers who carry donated cells not only across the country, but also across the world. The complexity of matching patients and donors result in half of these cellular donations crossing an international border. Domestic and international travel bans, border closings, declining availability of passenger airline service, quarantine and shelter in place orders, and an ever-changing patchwork of state and local restrictions during the COVID pandemic have created near catastrophic barriers to our ability to facilitate timely transplant and threaten to impede every one of these life or death missions at multiple points along what is now a tenuous path from donor to waiting patient. But despite all of that, I'm thrilled to be able to report to you today that throughout the course of the pandemic, NMDP Be The Match through innovation and determination has since March delivered more than 2,500 life-saving therapies to patients who are relying on them without a single failure. Not one patient prepped for transplant has gone without. Everyone associated with this program understands the consequences of failure are the direst consequences of all. But these successes have been hard-earned and in many cases involve days-long, around-the-clock, extraordinary interventions across multiple federal agencies, as well as state and foreign governments. Due in material part to the national program status awarded us under the authorizing statute over the past few months, we've been granted a waiver in the national interest by the CDC to the European travel ban, allowing international bone marrow, marrow couriers to deliver products to U.S. patients. We've designated our couriers and donors as essential critical infrastructure uh, by the Department of Homeland Security, CISA. We've leveraged private aircraft donated for use to aid by HHS to deliver life-saving cells when pay, uh, to patients when commercial flights were no longer available. We've accessed support from U.S. embassies and consulates to obtain from foreign governments timely travel authorizations for donor and courier travel and to coordinate private and humanitarian flights in and out of countries that had otherwise closed their borders. And we've been granted clearance from Customs and Border Protection that ensures donations coming from Canada to American patients will have uninterrupted transport into the country. The examples I've just described share two common but two extraordinarily important threads. First, this would not have been achieved without our national program status. And second, patients in the U.S. would have died had these things not happened. And that's why I'm before you today, urging your help to ensure timely reauthorization of the program to mitigate any unnecessary risk to patient life. 
Thank you again for the opportunity to submit this testimony and for the committee's longstanding support of this program that has given so many a second chance at life. On behalf of those lives that have been, on behalf of those whose lives have been extended, those who are searching the registry for a matched donor today, and those who will need to look to the program for help in the future, we urge you to once again reauthorize the CW Bill Young Cell Transplantation Program, and we would respectfully ask you do so prior to the program lapsing at the end of September. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Lindbergh. What, what a powerful story. Um, uh, given all the challenges of COVID that you have uh, had to deal with, uh, this is, uh, each one of you has a powerful story uh, in your testimony, and uh, uh, Mr. Lindbergh's uh, uh, was as well. Thank you. Uh, I served with Bill Young, and I think that he'd be very, very proud. Very proud. Thank he you. Was a, a gentleman, of, uh, a lovely, good man. Uh, next, the chair recognizes Travis uh, Tigart. Um, you. Mr. Tigart, you're uh, recognized for five minutes for your testimony, and thank you for being with us today. Welcome. Thank you, Chair Issue, Ranking Member Burgess, members of the subcommittee. Good morning. My name is Travis Tigart, and I'm the CEO of the United States Anti Doping Agency or USADA. Thank you for inviting me to be here, appear before you today to discuss, discuss our reauthorization and our important mission. It's a huge honor to be here representing our North Star, which are our clean athletes. We greatly appreciate the ongoing support of Congress and the President's Office of National Drug Control Policy, or ONDCP, to protect, along with us, the health, safety, and rights of clean athletes to a fair and level playing field. USADA, as you know, is charged with implementing a robust, fair program, which includes both in and out of competition testing, results management, and athlete education for all U.S. Olympic, Paralympic, Pan Am athletes. Importantly, we also contribute to the advancement of all clean sport through scientific research, education initiatives focused on values and healthy and safe competition. Chair Issue, members of the subcommittee, we cannot perform this essential mission without your support. As many of you know, we opened our doors in late 2000, thanks to the bipartisan efforts of Congress in recognizing the need to create an independent anti-doping system. Throughout the 1990s, many viewed the US and our athletes as dirty. There was no independent effort because the Olympic sports movement, whose job it is to promote sport, was also handling the anti-doping program. It was the epitome of the fox guarding the hen house. As a result, Congress took action and established an independent organization to implement a fair and robust national program. This landmark decision literally changed the game for U.S. athletes for the good. This independence is our lifeblood and is possible only through government support that we receive each year. We received federal funding in the fall of 2000 and every year since. We were first formally authorized by the committee and Congress in 2006 and we were reauthorized in 2014. Our congressional funding comes through ONDCP and is combined with our private funding to achieve our, our mission. Since we opened, we have educated tens of thousands of athletes and others on the reason that playing fair is the only way. Our True Sport Partner Program has reached over 13.8 million since its founding in 2017. Deterrence is the foundation of the entire program. And we have conducted approximately 175,000 drug tests. In 2019, we completed a total of 7,300 blood and urine tests. We have also earned the trust that we fairly enforce the rules, even when not easy or popular to do so. This is essential to our success. In 2019, we received 533 tips to our Play Clean whistleblower line and resolved 49 cases. Importantly, when we were sued by Lance Armstrong, a federal court ruled that the USADA process provides due process. This will likely be the most important legal legacy ever that due process is afforded our Olympic and Paralympic athletes. The final component is our scientific and research efforts. Along with others, we have advanced the science to now have reliable laboratory methods to detect and thus deter things like EPO or human growth hormone or designer steroid use. We also joined forces and raised additional private money with Major League Baseball and the National Football League to establish a scientific research entity that has become a world leader. Of course, you can see from our independent audit that we send to Congress every year, we are efficient and we are good stewards of the funding. 
We are lean and mean, and for just a small amount of government funding, we have changed the game for the good. Comparatively, the U.S. government is funding less on average per athlete than many other countries. As one example, the U.K. government provided its agency a million dollars more in funding than us, yet they have less than half the athletes we do. USADA's reauthorization, as was mentioned by the chair, is even more important this time around, since the Summer Olympic and Paralympic Games are coming to the United States in L.A. in 2028. By passing this reauthorization, you can help make sure the 2028 Olympic Games are the cleanest games ever. Finally, our authorization strengthens our ability to influence globally. Congress's backing gives us the standing to advocate so that our athletes' rights are also protected when they compete abroad. USADA's independent model has become a beacon to others, and we are humbled to be in the position to lead within the global community. Just last, last month, at the request of Congress, ONDCP sent a report to Congress detailing the World Anti-Doping Agency's governance problems, including its lack of independence, failure to provide fair athlete and U.S. representation. We applaud ONDCP for its work on this issue, and hopefully you all have seen that several leading athlete groups from Canada, the United States, Germany, and others have come out strongly in favor and support of these principles. Chair Issue, Ranking Member Burgess, members of the subcommittee, Congress did the right thing almost 20 years ago by establishing an independent anti-doping organization. And you all have continued to support this model to this day. Along with the millions of athletes we represent, we thank you for your ongoing support and hopefully for the swift passage of H.R. 5373. And I look forward to taking any of your questions. And thank you for your wonderful testimony and for being with us uh, today. Uh, we'll now move to uh, member questions. And I uh, recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, uh, to the witnesses that I don't get to with questions, it doesn't mean that I don't respect your program. Um, uh, you've all given superb testimony. They're very important programs. Uh, I want to zero in on the uh, Creating Hope Reauthorization Act uh, because we have um, uh, some differing views here. So uh, to Dr. Kesselheim, uh, the GAO found that uh, drug developers said the voucher program uh, plays uh, a major part, has played a major part in their decision to invest in the development of rare pediatric drugs. But your research found no increase in the development of rare pediatric drugs after the voucher program began. Um, so my first question to you is, uh, and I wanna get my questions in first and then take the answers, how do you explain the differences in these findings? To Ms. Goodman, uh, uh, Dr. Kesselheim's research paper used drug development for rare adult diseases as the comparison group for rare pediatric diseases. But in your experience, how is the drug development process uh, different for pediatric drugs versus adult drugs? And to both of you, do you believe that the pediatric voucher program has existed long enough to prove whether it's beneficial or harm, harmful? And if so, what benefits have you seen and what harm? And uh, so why don't we start with um, uh, Dr. Kesselheim, just to, uh, please try to keep your comments, um, your comment brief so that I can get uh, all of the answers to my questions. I will, I will do my best. So uh, you're on call, me. doctor. I, I will do my best, Chairwoman, to, to be brief. Um, I would say that the difference is, is that the GAO report was based on anecdotal uh, interviews with individual companies, and and my st uh, the study that we did was a comprehensive study that looked at all new drug development. And so um, it would be possible for you know in, in in subjective interviews for companies to say sure why not, but but if you actually look at the data across the board, it doesn't look like there's any difference. I think that's uh -huh. how you. Well, I represent uh, Stanford University, the Stanford Medical Center, uh, and um, uh, Dr. Crystal um, Mackel, uh, she's the leading cancer researcher at, at the Stanford Medical School, and she's a clinician. Uh, she said the voucher program has been remarkably uh, impactful for childhood cancers. She said before the program, she used to go with her hat in hand to beg investors to consider a potential drug. And now people take a second look and are interested in developing drugs. Uh, and she named them. Uh, she said something very interesting that a bean counter may be disappointed by the sheer numbers of approved pediatric drugs. 
but she said that that disregards the lengthy drug development cycle, and it's more important to look at the impact of the approved drugs, and then she named them. Um, so uh, I, I just wanted to insert that. Um, when you say the GAO interviewed people and it was anecdotal, the GAO usually does very thorough work. So um, I, I don't know how you, how did you get to identify the GAO's uh, report as uh, anecdotal? Because that's how the GAO describes it in its report. It says that the way that they identified the um, how how drug companies thought what drug companies thought about it is by interviewing some of them. Okay, uh, Ms. Goodman, can you uh, answer my questions, please? And anything else you want to add? Uh, yes, and thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Look, I think there's a lot of evidence that this has been a very successful program. There are more approved drugs. There are loads of new drugs in the development pipeline, which we can measure by designations. And how do we explain that away? Um, even Mr. Dr. Kesselheim in his health affairs piece notes that um, the program has been, you know, has shown that for drugs that qualify for vouchers, they speed through the drug development process faster, and they're more likely to go from one phase to the other. But now, it is true that the program's weakest point of um, effectiveness is at the very start when drug developers decide, will I develop a drug for seriously ill children or for some other indication, right? Um, and so I agree with Mr. Kesselheim, uh, Dr. Kesselheim, in part on that point. But the reason there is this problem is that um, drug development takes, you know, 10 or more years, and we keep on reauthorizing this program for very short periods of time. Mm -hmm. If we reauthorize it for a permanent um, length of time, we're going to see Dr. Kesselheim very happy about the um, effect of this program on early drug decisions. If, if I could just clarify just a, a missing mistake about the way that my, what my study actually shows. So my study didn't show any difference in the ways that drugs progress from phase two to phase three or phase three to approval. Although it did show that there was a statistically significant effect on the progress from phase one to phase two. Phase one is also tends to be the shortest phase of, of clinical trial drug development. So it's unclear of how meaningful that is overall. The most important finding was that it doesn't appear that there are any new drugs that come into the system before or after the voucher program as compared to um, rare adult diseases. And I would just point out that over the last uh, doctor, couple of decades. My time, uh, my time has um, uh, uh, run out, uh, but I think it's important to note uh, of the, uh, the drugs that have been approved as uh, Dr. Uh, Mackle says at, uh, at uh, Stanford uh, Medical School and uh, it all, all, she also works out of uh, Lucille Packard Children's Hospital in my district. Uh, it's now, uh, let's see, uh, we go to, um, who is next? Uh, who is? Uh, to the ranking member of the subcommittee, Dr. Burgess, for his questions, five minutes. I thank the chair. Uh, maybe we could continue this discussion that we just started a little bit. Uh, Dr. Kesselham, uh, Ms. Goodman mentioned in her testimony that the number of rare pediatric disease drugs approved by the FDA since the enactment of the Creating Hope Act, Creating Hope Act has increased by over 120%. Uh, do you have a sense of how the United States compares to other nations when it comes to rare pediatric drug development? Um, well, I believe that that the United States is, you know, helps contribute substantially to rare pediatric disease drug development because of the substantial amount of money uh, through the NIH that goes into the discovery and development of the of some of the key, you know, drugs that that emerge uh, for all kinds of conditions, including rare pediatric diseases. And I, my presumption is, is that those drugs also are available in other countries around the world, although I haven't studied that. But as far as the development of a, a, a drug to treat a rare pediatric cancer, I, I would suspect that it is likely, more likely to happen in the United States than other countries. But perhaps we can find that out on our own. If I could intervene, uh, yeah, yeah. Just, sure. Um, yes, you know, the vast a uh, predominant vast uh, majority of drugs developed for seriously ill kids are right here in the United States. And if we don't get our incentives right, kids all over the world are going to suffer. Um, and so I, I think this is a real issue. I think you hit it right on the head. So let me just ask you, because you brought up the point about the reauthorization date. And I, I don't know if a lot of people are aware of this. This program was started in a 
Food and Drug Administration Reauthorization Act back in 2012, but it is not linked to the reauthorization of the FDA reauthorizations that we do every five years. So this program expires September 30th, kind of all on its own. Talk about an orphan, uh, it's out there by itself. And you made, I thought, of a, an excellent point that it ought to be reauthorized and perhaps the permanence or a longer period of time because we do have a, a long time horizon with these, uh, uh, these products that are in development. That's correct. Look, um, the first drug to get a um, voucher for pediatric cancer is uh, dinatuximab by Unitexin. And this drug was in development for 30 years. So even if we do, even if we extend this program by seven or 10 years, we're, there's still going to be a large portion of drugs that we don't can't incentivize and we can't support. You know, as I, as, as I was listening to you and, and one of the earlier witnesses, of course, we're, we're so fortunate on this committee, the full committee, to have worked on 21st Century Cures Act that Chairman Upton championed and, and, and got through. Uh, also pointed out to me in 2015 how there'd been no new therapeutic for sickle cell disease approved for 40 years. No FDA approved therapy for sickle cell for 40 years. Very reminiscent of your comments about no new children's drug developed for 40 years. So, you know, we don't always do things perfectly in this committee, but sometimes we can make things a priority that actually do make a difference in, in people's lives. And from time to time, we ought to acknowledge that, celebrate that success, and recognize that's equity that we can push forward if we're willing to do that. So the question of making things a priority becomes a, becomes an, an important point. Now, Mr. Lindbergh, just before my time runs out, I, I signed up to be a donor uh, in the donor program uh, to see if I could be a donor match. Uh, where there was some drive going on in my community long before I ever came to Congress. I've been here for a while. Is that, uh, is, is that enlistment still active? Does, does a citizen need to re-up that from time to time? What can you tell us as, as we're here today highlighting your program? What do people need to know about, uh, about signing up and the length of time that they may be signed up for a, a marrow donor program? Thank you, Ranking Member Burgess. Um, so, and thank you for signing up to to join the registry. Our um, criteria, eligibility criteria, do state that once a volunteer um, registry member reaches the age of sixty-one, that person ages off the registry. That's a um, a cell efficacy oh, issue. That's <laughs> <laughs> See, this, this is what we like. We like people objecting to to aging off. Um, what we one thing that we know is that uh, over over 30 years of this program and uh, our work with our outcomes database, we know that uh, we, we know that despite a very good HLA or DNA match, that as a donor ages, um, that there are poorer outcomes for the recipient. So we know that our our network transplant physician community um, looks for um, young healthy donors and will uh, prioritize those over those uh, like me who uh, are a bit more aged than than others. Okay, well, I, I actually did not know that. So that's useful information that game this morning. Uh, I, I didn't realize you'd been so insensitive as to bump me off simply because <laughs> I got too dang old. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, again, I've learned something this morning. I'll, I'll yield back. Uh, the gentleman yields back. Uh, the chair is now pleased to recognize the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Pallone, for his five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I wanted to ask my questions of uh, Dr. Kesselheim, and they're all about the rare pediatric disease uh, uh, priority review voucher. Um, I, I wanted to say that I, while I believe that we, or while I think we all agree that more has to be done to expand research into treatments and cures for diseases that affect children and adolescents, and that those treatments and cures should be accessible to those who need it, I think the committee needs to carefully consider whether the rare pediatric PRV program is tailored to achieve those ends, and, and that requires an analysis of the costs and benefits. And when making policy decisions to reauthorize programs, generally we have to analyze how they've worked in the past, and that can be particularly challenging when we're looking at an incentive program where we have to determine whether the desired effect would have happened without the incentive provided by Congress. So Dr. Kesselheim, with that uh, by way of background, I was interested in the portion of your testimony 
when you described how you did an empirical study into how the rare pediatric PRV program acted as an incentive. Could you describe the way or the methods you used in your study and your findings in that regard? Sure. So what we did was we identified all new drugs that are coming into the pipeline, not drugs that are FDA approved, drugs that are coming into the pipeline. And we identified whether or not they were directed towards pediatric rare diseases and adult rare diseases. And then um, we looked to see in the years before the pediatric review voucher program uh, in 2012 was extended to um, rare pediatric diseases. And in the years after, whether or not there was a difference between the number of new rare pediatric drugs entering into the pipeline and the number of new adult dr rare drugs entering into the pipeline, which theoretically wouldn't have been incentivized at all because they wouldn't have gotten, they wouldn't have been eligible to get a voucher. We found no difference in the trajectory before and after. What we did notice was that the trajectory has been increasing, which is a, a good thing, but what it just means is that it just means that rare diseases in general are a point of a lot of research for, for drug companies and and the and the and and public funding and we're just getting a lot more new drugs for rare diseases across the board over the last couple of decades the rare pediatric disease voucher program was extended to rare pediatric diseases in 2012 doesn't seem to have affected the trajectory at all well now let me issue this i i know the program does not have a budget score or or really cost the federal government any money uh but there may be you know other costs associated with it so in that regard can you describe how the program affects FDA resources? Sure, and I would actually disagree that the program doesn't cost the government any money. The government, the program does cost the government a lot of money because what the program does is it lets run-of-the-mill, non-innovative drugs onto the market sooner so that they can start being charged extremely high prices to Medicare and Medicaid, which of course are government-funded insurance programs. That's where the voucher gets its value from. But in terms of the FDA, yes, in those in that same GAO study where they interviewed drug companies, they also interviewed people at the FDA and the people at the FDA said, look, this is a real burden on our resources, uh, even though there is an additional uh, user fee associated with it. Um, it's just not something that, we, it, it, you know, it is it, it strains our ability to prioritize what we think are, are important public health drugs and put those at the top of the queue. Well, let me ask you one last question. Uh, the bill before us would fully remove the sunset and authorize the program indefinitely. I know you're in your testimony, you said you would prefer to see this program expire, but if the program were to continue, which I think is likely, uh, what improvements would you recommend? Right, well, so first of all, I would say, um, I, I would say first of all, that the, the PRV should not be able to apply to drugs that are uh, that should only be able to apply the, to drugs that are first in class or to drugs that meet an unmet medical need. Uh, I would say that the PRV should not be able to apply to drugs that are approved via the accelerated approval pathway because those drugs do not have a demonstrated effect on actual patient outcomes. And I would say that any drug that gets a PRV should be required to make the drug available to patients at a uh, value-based price that is consistent with the same price for which it is available to, to pediatric rare disease patients in other countries so that patients can have access to the drugs um, that they really need. Congressman, uh -oh. if, I may, if I may jump in here for a moment, and, and I'm gonna honestly say I would disagree with Dr. Kesselheim on every single point he's made, but let's just start with the pricing issue. You know, there are two kinds of ways to provide access to drugs, um, access to drugs for patients. And there are two groups of patients. One are patients who already have drugs. And so for those patients, of course, we would like the drugs to be as low as the pricing as low as possible. But the other group of patients don't have th therapies to treat their illnesses yet. And that includes my son, Jacob. And we can't expect that we're going to give that class of patients best access to drugs if we're going to be suppressing prices of therapies that haven't even been developed yet. The second point I just want to make is with respect to, you know, we're talking a lot about this health affairs article. And I think Dr. Kesselheim is, you know, playing fast and loose with a bunch of numbers. If you look at his charts, there are notable deltas between um, pediatric and adult, the adult curves. And um, of course, um, the weakest point in the efficacy of the program is right at the start um, when, when developers decide, do they want to develop drugs for kids? That's why we need a permanent program. All right, my time is expired, but what did you say, doctor? I'm sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, well, I, I know that um, 
went over by almost a minute, but uh, it's a very important discussion and uh, perhaps other members will uh, uh, follow up on the uh, on the points that um, are, are being made. Uh, it's a pleasure to recognize uh, the gentleman from uh, Michigan, the um, uh, former chairman of the full committee, uh, Mr. Upton for his five minutes of questions. Well, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I'm delighted to be here. And I'm also just want to say, uh, I want to thank Mr. Sarbanes and others, Republicans and Democrats that are a co-sponsor of this important legislation on school-based health centers, uh, something that we need to reauthorize. Uh, for me, I've been terribly supportive of this uh, program. Uh, I would note that in my district, uh, I have a number of these uh, facilities and I'm very concerned that uh, particularly as schools uh, are gonna have limited openings, uh, it appears, uh, from e-learning, uh, limited days, uh, how exactly are we going to make sure that our kids uh, and school kids and their families then are able to benefit uh, from these school-based clinics? And I guess that that question is for Mr. Boyd, Dr. Boyd, if, if you might comment. I'll put down the uh, earphones and back on. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yes, Congressman, it's Mr. Um, schools did not close. They went to remote learning. School-based health centers, to the best of their abilities, did not close. They went to remote operations through telehealth. Our dilemma, and I, I'm not an alarmist. I, I worked with Congresswoman Brooks for a number of years on school safety. Um, we have a pending health care crisis coming in our schools. That is shared by all of the major education groups, all of the major school-based health partners that we have in the nurses, the psychologists, the counselors, and the, and the social workers. And it's not just mental health. Kids are not getting their vaccines. Um, they're not getting their life-saving medications for diabetes and, and treatments for asthma. We have to address these issues. School-based health centers are going to continue to try to serve their students. I know anecdotally, we don't have a lot of good data, but we've been in close touch with school-based health centers around the country. I know anecdotally of stories of uh, clinicians asking school resource officers and, and educators to go check up on children that they haven't heard from. We don't know how many Title I school kids have not been served by the continuing of education through remote learning or the continuing of, of health care through, through telehealth. We just don't know what the numbers are yet. Um, so I, I want to make clear that, that we're going to continue to operate to the best of our abilities, whether school buildings reopen or not. One of our great concerns at the Alliance is the ability of school-based health centers to reopen. A number of them are sponsored by federally qualified health centers, some by public health agencies, some by hospital systems, some by school districts. In the cases where they could take those workers and put them back on the front line, keep them on the front line in the primary uh, community health center or the primary hospital, they did just that. The question will be whether or not they'll be able to move them back to the schools should that building reopen. And so we have a pending crisis and, you know, we're, we're going to be right there on the front lines with our partners in education to, uh, to address the needs of the students that we serve. But uh, the resources are short. The resources are, are scant. So a, a quick question to, to finish up on my time. So schools in Michigan pretty mm -hmm. much closed in March, mm -hmm. in March. Um, and, and they were shut down through their Easter break. And, and uh, it's, it's somewhat unclear as schools struggle. I talked to a number of our superintendent, my superintendents this past week as they are trying to prepare for uh, opening up at, at, uh, at some point in the next number of weeks, usually the, the end of August uh, is when they do it. Do we have any sense of how many children uh, in any of the states actually missed a vaccination or uh, perhaps got into uh, any even anecdotal evidence of 
of kids running into trouble because their health needs were unmet uh, as related not only to the school closings in the spring, uh, but also the preparations of, as they they have to include that uh, when they begin to open up this fall. Yeah, it's it's only anecdotal at this point, uh, Mr. Upton. It's it's not. Uh, there is no data at this point for us to be able to know how many children have missed vaccinations and how many children have that no one's even heard from. Um, anecdotally, I've heard from colleagues at the Coalition of Community Schools that it could be as many as a third of uh, Title I school children have no one's heard from in some districts. That's a scary number because it's not just the education side that we're not hearing from them. They're not getting their health care because the school-based health center was their, their health home. Um, we may see that start to turn up in uh, reports from emergency rooms because that's where they would seek help if they're not getting it at school. Uh, but we don't have those kinds of numbers. They've got their hands full right now just with the coronavirus. We do know that we're, we're all very concerned, as I said in my remarks, about um, abuse, that we have no idea what the numbers are of, of going on with, with school children around abuse. We just don't know. Thank you. I know my time has expired. I yield back. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. The gentleman yields back. Uh, pleasure to recognize uh, the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Butterfield, for his five minutes of questions. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Eshoo, for convening this, this hearing today, and thank you for your passionate leadership, not just on these issues, but so many issues that we have dealt with as a committee. Thank you to our full committee chairman, uh, my friend, Frank Malone. I thank you, Frank, for your leadership. I certainly respect your views on PRVs and just look forward, look forward to working with you uh, to, to get this right. Uh, I know you have a strong conviction for, for helping uh, young children who are affected with cancer and I know we will we will find some common ground and, and get this thing right and and finally thank you to the six witnesses thank you so very much for your passion I can literally feel your passion uh, as you testify today let me just hone in on Miss Goodman and and I've met you before Miss Goodman and and just thank you for your strength and and what you bring to this debate uh Miss Goodman your testimony indicates that the rare pediatric disease priority review voucher of course we call it PRV uh, that this program is working as intended. Uh, you mentioned that both the number of rare pediatric disease designations and the number of drugs approved for these conditions actually increased after the creation of the program. Uh, a scientist at Duke University, which is located in, in my congressional district in North Carolina, whose invention is in clinical trials in children with brain tumors. Uh, this, this doc told my office that even though brain tumors are the most common cause of death from cancer in children and infants, they are still rare. And for most children, there is no effective, safe therapy available. He said that this program serves a, a very, very unique role in assuring continued clinical research efforts on behalf of a vulnerable and underserved patient community. And so, Ms. Goodman, it has been eight years, eight long years since the rare pediatric disease, uh, the PRV was created, yet we know that, that, that it often takes a decade, 10 years or more, to develop the drug. My bill, which is co-sponsored by 16 members, and I think one more has joined us this morning, uh, 17 members of this committee would permanently reauthorize this life-saving program. How would a long-term extension of the PRV impact research and drug development for children. Please help me with this and put your comments in the record. Thank you, Congressman Butterfield. Um, look, even though the program has been in effect for eight years due to your leadership, each time we've had to reauthorize the program, we've only had an opportunity to do reauthorizations of three months, one year, one year, and four years. So um, drug developers at the very beginning of the drug development um, process when they're looking 10 or 15 years out, um, they don't have any assurance that the program is going to be there for them. And so they may or may not be persuaded by the existence of the pediatric voucher program. Um, and they may or may not use the possibility of getting a voucher if the program is reauthorized to start developing drugs for seriously ill children. 
If we have a permanent program, we're going to see many, many more drugs for seriously ill kids. Well, you know, as legislators, we're always concerned about the cost uh, of a program to the taxpayer. Can you tell me if this program has a cost uh, our taxpayers any money at all? No, sir. No money at all. The CBO scored this program at zero. Very good. Ms. Goodman, as Jacob's mom and as the founder of Kids uh, versus Cancer, do you think do you think that the rare pediatric disease program should be permanently reauthorized? Not only your view, but the viewpoint of our stakeholders and our friends that you associate with every day. I do. I believe that re permanent reauthorization will ensure that this incentive has maximum effect. And I have not received a cent from any of these vouchers, but I don't mind if um, other biotechs are well-funded so that they develop drugs for seriously ill kids. And finally, let me close out by, by, by speaking directly to, uh, to Mr. Boyd. Dr. Boyd, thank you very much for, for your testimony today. Uh, I realize that COVID is, uh, is different in every state and every jurisdiction, uh, but uh, does it matter that a school district uh, has insufficient funding? Uh, in, in the tier one school systems that I specifically have in mind, does funding uh, become a factor in, in the decision to reopen? Yeah, as of right now, sir, we don't receive any funding from educational sources. Our funding is uh, through grants that help get the school-based health center open and then from reimbursement from um, primarily Medicaid and CHIP although some are set up to take private health insurance, but for the most part, the kid we, kids we serve don't, um, don't have private insurance. We are hopeful in the Senate bill that, that is being considered, the Republican uh, Senate bill, that school-based health centers will become an eligible uh, use. So we'd hope that you would consider that if it comes before the House Thanks so that we can uh, have money to reopen and restart. Thank you very much. Those negotiations are taking place as we talk. Thank you very Thanks. much. Am I unmuted? Yeah. yeah. Are you back? The gentleman yields back. Uh, pleasure to recognize the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Guthrie, for his five minutes questions. Thank you, Madam Thanks. Chair, for having this, hosting this meeting. And uh, to Ms. Goodman, thanks for being here and, and honoring your son, Jacob, with your effort. I, I guess we're in a 40 year time frame. So when I was in junior high, which is about 40 years ago, I lost a, a friend. And every time I see uh, St. Jude ads, I always think of her. Uh, we were from the South, and so she went to St. Jude. And you know, this day with her category, she probably would have survived. So what we're doing here is important and, and research really changes families' lives. So thanks for that. My question though is about Mr. Lindbergh, and it's, I'm on the registry as well. Um, we had a big, um, bone marrow drive for someone in our community son that was a young young person too that needed bone marrow so i had a huge drive and i didn't match him but later on i matched and got called and went and did all of the process here it's it's a lot when you don't when you donate actually and i got right to the point where i was supposed to be scheduled to go donate and it was canceled and i, and I always hoped and prayed that it was because they found a better match i'm not, and they wouldn't tell me why they canceled i always kind of wondered who was who that other person was, we never were able to get that far down the process, but hopefully he or she found a better match and is, is still with us today. I, I just would love to know that, but I know there's no way to know. Um, but during June, during the, what's remarkable is that the bone, your bone, your program facilitated more transplants in June than ever before. And it was encouraging to see during the pen in the middle of a global pandemic. So my questions are, could you please uh, speak to your work with the health and human services? in order to ensure these transplants were possible in June. And moving forward, what needs to be done to ensure transplants can continue during the coronavirus pandemic? And how do we, how can we prepare better? So you had out your work with HHS uh, to ensure that we can continue moving forward. And then what do you think we can do to make it better during if another uh, pandemic comes and be better prepared? Thank you. Thank you, Congressman Guthrie. And thank you for going through the process almost getting to that point um, where you donated. Uh, I, I, can, I can tell you that after 15 years of working with this program myself, just that hope that um, having a donor, a potentially matching donor available for a patient, that hope means an awful lot. And like you, I will hope that um, there was just simply a better DNA matched donor for that patient out there. Uh, thanks for your question. With respect to HHS, we have enjoyed um, so, so many decades of 
public-private partnership with our colleagues at HRSA and HHS. Um, they have uh, been extraordinarily helpful to us throughout the course of pandemic. We work shoulder to shoulder with them. Um, uh, one example that I'll provide is that as we were very much struggling with um, commercial flights being being canceled, one, one of the, the things that I'll mention to the committee quickly is that we, we take these courier trips so seriously, um, many times, many, many times, patients have been myoablated, meaning their immune systems have been removed before uh, a product that is collected internationally can be delivered to their transplant center. So if we, if we miss, that has very, very dire consequences, so we can't miss. Um, we take we our couriers take these products in coolers and they they enter into the passenger compartment of a commercial airline many times and fly overseas to bring those uh, those products back to the patient's bedside. Um, as those commercial flights started to dry up, as schedules started to be eviscerated, um, as pandemic hit. Uh, one of the things that we worked with um, HHS around was they had received an in-kind donation of private flight time um, from um, uh, an entity that I, I can't name because they've had, they've a private entity that's act, asked to, to remain confidential. But uh, those those flight hours were donated to us, and we were able to work through HHS to uh, procure these private flights to move donors and couriers overseas so that we didn't miss, like I said, we didn't miss one time. Um, I think that's a remarkable thing and it's just, it's grit and determination and uh, incredible help. Um, so I, I'm so proud of my colleagues here at National Marrow Donor Program, Be The Match, and I'm proud of our partnership with the government over 30 years. Uh, it's been extraordinary. In terms of what we can do going forward, uh, this program reauthorization and doing it in a timely way is a, of immediate importance to us and my, my colleagues here at the NMDP. Uh, so much of our success over the course of the last four months has pivoted on our national program status. I, I, I fear that if the program lapses, we may lose um, some of that really important leverage that we've had with foreign governments in particular. Um, if we lose the full force of the federal government behind us, all of a sudden, we're a we're a nonprofit here, sitting in here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Okay, it's a thanks. really great nonprofit. Yes, thank you. I'm but about that's out of time. Help. Thank you very much. I'm 56, so I, hopefully I'll get called within the next five years. So, thank you, so sir. Appreciate you very much, and thank you all for everybody else for being here. Sorry to get to your questions. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, it's a pleasure to recognize uh, our wonderful colleague from California, Ms. Matsui, for her five minutes of questions. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, for having this important hearing. And I thank the witnesses for being here today. These are all important bills and we all want them to pass. Um, and a special thank you to uh, Mr. Lindbergh for testifying today about the importance of the National Bone Marrow Program and cord blood inventory. Um, you can tell it's a popular subject because many people have already talked about it and some of the questions have already been covered, but I think we should keep talking about it more because uh, the bone marrow program is really very critical. In fact, um, my late husband, um, Bob Matsui, uh, had MDS, and there was a time, I guess 15 years ago or more, when he was ill, when it wasn't really possible for him to get the bone marrow uh, that he needed. So the more we have, the better it is. Um, we, every three minutes, we know that someone is diagnosed with blood cancer, and for patients and families facing these fatal diseases, a bone marrow or cord blood transplant may be the best treatment or only potential for a cure. Congress recognized the need to coordinate these life-saving transplants in creating the CW Bill Young tra Cell Transplantation Program, a strong bipartisan public health priority. I'm proud to say that in working with my colleagues, the program's authorization has never lapsed since it was first enacted in 2005. Because most patients diagnosed do not have a suitable uh, donor and their family. The program's national registry, known as the Be, Be the Match, which matches patients in need with possible unrelated volunteer bone marrow or cord blood donors, is truly a lifeline. We have to continue to encourage donors and give these patients with otherwise fatal blood cancers a second chance at life. And that's why I was pleased to join Representatives Bilirakis and Pingree to introduce the Transplant Act of 2019. 
legislation to reauthorize the CW Bill Young Cell Transplantation Program and the National Cord Blood Inventory for no another five years. Um, so anyway, a, just to continue on, you mentioned in your testimony some of the roles that the National Marrow Donor Program plays in addition to running the National Registry. Can you elaborate a bit on the work that Be The Match MMDP plays? I would be thrilled to do, to do that. Congresswoman Matsui, and thank you again for unwavering support over the years. Uh, I see direct line of sight between your advocacy for this program and thousands of patients' and lives saved here. So thank you for that. Uh, NMDP Be The Match is the uh, largest, uh, I would argue, most sophisticated registry of uh, volunteer bone marrow donors in the world. Um, we have, I think, been now again a world leader over the course of the last four months as the globe has been hit with pandemic. We have been able to, um, with the help of you and your colleagues, um, pull levers that we would not have been able to pull otherwise with the state um, and foreign governments in order to continue to move um, these life-saving products in a timely way all across the world. Um, and we continue, and we intend to continue to do that. Okay. You know, the number of transplants for racial and ethnic minority patients has increased substantially from the year 2000 to today. What efforts is Be The Match making to continue to expand the diversity of the registry to ensure that minority patients can find matches? Yes, thank you for that question, Congresswoman Matsui. Um, I was about to go there and decided that I would I would hold a moment. I wanted to to mention that our five year strategic plan. Our mission is to save lives through cell therapy. Our vision to do that is we we talk about democratizing cell therapy and what we mean by that when we say that is that no matter who you are, no matter your race, your ethnicity, your religion, your creed, your economic status that it is our obligation to find for you that match and to deliver that match to you in hopes that your life can be saved. And what we know today is that because of the peculiarities of, of our DNA and, and our HLA, that it is unfortunately far more difficult for those who are in historically underserved populations to find that good match. So we have uh, doubled down on our efforts to serve underserved communities and we've set a metric that we're moving well towards to double the number of uh, transplants in, in ethnic populations in five years. Well, thank you very much. To appreciate your hard work. And uh, we know this has to be reauthorized. Uh, it's such important work. So thank you very much. And I yield back. Gentlewoman yields back. Uh, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, is recognized for his five minutes of questions. We're so happy to see you and know that you're doing well. Thanks, I'm glad to be with you all. And uh, yeah, things are going very well. Uh, it, it's really interesting. I was the 17th member who signed on to uh, continuing uh, and permanently funding uh, uh, Chairman But or Mr. Butterfield's uh, bill. Um, and, and I'll just relate to you uh, what happens. Sometimes timing is important. Uh, I was at the pool within the last couple of days with my boys who are 14 and 12. And I was talking to a dad whose son is entering the sixth grade and he has uh, just gotten over leukemia or is at least in remission. Uh, we were talking about this very program and I reiterated to him my support for it. Can't think of a better way to show that support than signing onto the bill and, and hopefully we can get this through and very pleased to have done that. Uh, but we all know somebody who is is affected or might be affected by this, and um, it just brings it all all home. That being said, um, uh, and I appreciate that, I do want to go to... Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you carrying it. Uh, I do want to go to uh, the anti-doping uh, agency, and I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, Mr. Tigart, are, are you available for a question there? Are you out there somewhere? In, I, I sure am. Yes, sir. Of the internet. Um, in your written testimony, you talk about the World Anti-Doping Agency, and you you reference that the United States is not able to be on the executive committee. What is the stated reason for that? Because we've been leading and pushing hard to make uh, the Olympics better. Why aren't we uh, on that executive committee of the World uh, Anti-Doping Agency? 
Yeah, the, the process for selection of the countries around the executive committee, we fall into the Americas region, which is 43 countries in South Latin, the Caribbean, uh, North America as well. And they had a, a rule change that says the chair of a council of sports ministers gets the seat at the WAD executive committee. And you may know we don't have a sports minister in the United States. So while you know there may be some technical ability to, to take that position, I think the reality is that no, no, no way the U.S. is going to have that seat. And both us and Canada have been extremely disappointed because we're the two largest funders to WADA as well. And do you think the rules change was specifically to, to exclude Canada and the U.S. because of our strong anti-doping position? It's a, it, Certainly that suggestion has been put out there. I don't have the, as a lawyer, I don't have the proof that I would want to, to prove it, but certainly that skepticism and, and question has to be asked. But what you're saying is, is that it's not just a conspiracy theory. There might be a little something there. If there's smoke, there might be some fire. It's just hard for me to believe that the largest funder and one of the powerful sport countries, as well as a country that has been leading with an independent model since 2000, does not have a seat at the most powerful committee at the World Anti-Doping Agency and, and realistically does not look to have one in, in the near future. And, and that's very disappointing. While I certainly hope that we'll continue to fund your agency, is there any action we should be taking to, uh, as a nation to express our disappointment and perhaps uh, roll back our funding uh, to that world anti-doping agency if they're going to exclude us? I, I think what ONDCP and we, as I said in my testimony, applaud the effort that they went to at the request of congressional appropriators for ONDCP to provide them a report, they, they lay it out perfectly well. And they ask for the opportunity to have discretion in their funding. I think up till now, they've seen it only as a contract that they had to pay, regardless of what WADA did, reform-wise or otherwise. And so we would, we would love, and we were thrilled that the House uh, Appropriations Subcommittee, FSGG, has given them, and it's markup, the discretion that they asked for, and we hope that the Senate does the same, and then allow ONDCP, who has the, the, the status within WADA's eyes, to be able to sit down with WADA and negotiate before just removing the money, but at the end of the day, without any leverage, money being the, the biggest leverage, um, the, the likelihood of change there is, is not realistic. Well, and I think that's important as well, as, as many members of this committee may re recall, and I don't remember if it, was, if it was this subcommittee or not, but we had uh, uh, Michael Phelps and a number of others in a couple of years ago talking about this very issue. And I think it's important. Uh, to, I think it's extremely important. And I think this committee thinks it's important that we make sure that we don't have doping in our sports in the United States or in our sports uh, across the world as our athletes compete. Uh, but do appreciate your hard work. Is there anything else Thank that you. Uh, you want us to know uh, before I finish my questioning? I, I think you're absolutely right. And there's no better testament to the number of household names in the Olympic movement, Paralympic movement, who stand beside us arm in arm to fight for their right to clean and healthy and safe sport. And we really appreciate the government's effort on this to give them the hope that they can compete in the right way. Well, I appreciate that. And I see my time is up. Madam Chair, I yield back. Uh, the gentleman. Um Yields back. Uh, a pleasure to recognize the gentlewoman from Florida, Ms. Castor, for her five minutes of questions. Nice to see you, Kath. Nice to see you. Thank you, Chairwoman Eshu. This is an important hearing with a lot of uh, uh, terrific bills. So thank you. And thanks to our witnesses who are here today. Uh, we need more school based health centers across America. So I want to. Uh, thank my colleagues, Rep uh, Sarbanes, Rep Tonko, uh, for leading that effort. I'm I'm a co-sponsor of that bill. Uh, I also appreciate the focus on rare pediatric diseases and creating hope for families and and what we what else we need to do in stem cells and in the anti-doping sphere as well. But I want to focus on the Early Act. I'm a co-sponsor of the Early Act, and I'm grateful to Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz and Congresswoman Brooks uh, for joining together to stand up for young women. Uh, Ms. Blount, uh, congratulations yes. to you. Uh, I understand the Black Women's Health Imperative uh, is celebrating 38 years of advocacy. We uh, are. Advocacy for health equity for Black women and girls across the country. Uh, I'm hopeful that the Early Act 
will help improve the diagnosis rates for African American women uh, who contract breast cancer. And I hope the Early Act will also help uh, help improve their care after they are diagnosed. In your testimony, you cite a number of very troubling statistics. Uh, black women develop breast cancer typically five to seven years younger than white women. And African American women are 40% more likely to die after a breast cancer diagnosis. Uh, that's not acceptable in this country. Uh, would you w mind walking us through the reasons for that and what else we should be doing about it? Yes, thank you for your, your question and your concern, Congresswoman, I appreciate that. There, there are a number of reasons, as, as you might imagine. Um, a lot of researchers will point to obesity rates, they'll point to underlying chronic conditions, they'll point to childbearing patterns among black women as an explanation for why um, they're getting breast cancer younger. And, and that may be true um, to some degree, but that can't explain it all. Because if you look at black women and, and white women and control for obesity rates, uh, control for childbearing patterns, age at when they, they have their first child, um, that doesn't explain the difference in breast cancer rates. So the, 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 the answer is we don't know exactly. There is something going on. And what a lot of researchers ha are now exploring, and, and frankly have been for quite a number of years, is looking at the impact of elevated cortisol levels. Black women have, on average, about 15% more cortisol in their bloodstream than white women. And we know a lot about what that does to the body. It triggers our inflammatory response, which in fact raises our risks for chronic disease. But we also now know that Elevated, chronically elevated cortisol also raises our risk for things like incompetent services. Um, infant mortality, maternal mortality have been dis demonstrated for years. So what we need to understand more is about is what this, what is happening, because we know it's not biology, we know it's not genetics, but what is happening in the lived experiences of black women that actually raises their risk for chronic diseases, particularly breast cancer. So what, What's the most effective, uh, what, what, what successful outreach initiatives have you seen that you would recommend to us? Well, I've seen a number of, of community-based outreach initiatives. I mean, our organization um, is, of course, among many that make sure to educate Black women on the importance of screening mammography in particular and starting at age 40. Um, this is very much a grassroots kind of exercise, uh, activity where we've got to make sure that providers recommend screening mammography. You'd be amazed at the percentage of providers who don't suggest that their patients get screening ma mammogram starting at age 40 and to explain the process. So we and other organizations have been involved working with federally qualified health centers and with the NMA and other medical associations to help educate black women on the importance and Latinas on the importance of getting that first mammogram, understanding your family history, and getting that early mammogram so that you know what your risk might be and can take the proper steps. That would save lives. Well, thank it would you very indeed. Much for your important work. Thank you, Congresswoman. The gentlewoman yields back. Uh, pleasure to recognize, um, oh God, every time I say, Representative Brooks, my heart sinks because uh, we don't want you to leave, but I am going to recognize you for your questions. It's wonderful to see you. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you so much for those kind words, but thank you to all of the witnesses uh, for your passionate testimony. Um, all of these bills are critically important, ensuring that we reauthorize all of these very important five public health bills. Um, it's also good to see you, Mr. Boyd. Uh, we have done work together in the past on school safety. And as the uh, mother of a Title I uh, teacher, um, all that you said about the concerns for our school-based programs, health centers are critically important. I wanna focus my time today though, and continue to follow up on what my colleague, Ms. Castor was just talking about. 
uh, with respect to breast cancer. It's not just another disease. It's personal for so many of us. I think uh, it's safe to assume that everyone in this hearing has been impacted in one way or another by someone who's suffered from breast cancer. And in fact, our colleague and dear friend, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, suffered from uh, early uh, breast cancer at the age of 41 back in 2007. And she has been a passionate advocate, as has the chairwoman, in fighting to make sure that young women um, have access to screening. Um, and I want to continue to talk about the importance of early detection uh, because we know that the we know that the higher chance a woman has in getting uh, detected, uh, they will beat that cancer. And Ms. Blount, you stated in your testimony, I think it's worth repeating, that if we can increase breast cancer screenings in women under 45 by just 50 percent, 3,000 more women per year will survive their diagnosis. Yet I think many young women in particular don't think about the importance of getting screened. And as you've said, the providers often don't encourage them to get screened. So while we're, um, let's talk a little bit further about um, what is the state of our nation's public awareness and education efforts in your opinion, particularly focused on younger women. Can you please share with us what you view as the, the state of our nation's public awareness campaigns and education efforts. I can't, and thank you for, thank you for that, that question, uh, Representative Brooks. It, it is certainly not where it needs to be. Um, you know, young people often feel invincible as we've seen with, with COVID-19 recently. And, you know, a young woman doesn't wanna think about breast cancer. I understand it, I understand it completely. But we've got to do more about making sure that she understands her risk and, her, and particularly her family history. So, you know, we've got the National Breast and Cervical Cancer Early Detection Program, which helps, but we also know there are, there are funding challenges with that program. In some states, the program may run out of money six, seven, eight months into the year. And while, you know, there is outreach that's done and, and we hope treatment occurs when there's a, a suspicious finding, um, you know, the, there's not the resources to reach all the women, and particularly young women, frankly, in the way they need to hear the message. Our, our public health conversation, our public health programs, the kind of language imagery we use is, frankly, fair, fairly old school. So a lot of what we in my organization are trying to do is use modern day images, terminology, communications mechanisms to make this message relevant to where women are today. And if we can do that, we can get them into screening early. Uh, thank you very much. Can you actually discuss uh, a, a few of the strategies that your organization, Black Women's Health Imperative, is using to educate these women? What kind of strategies specifically is your organization using, and how can we ensure that these young women get the access that they need? We can. We're, of course, using social media. We are going right to where these young women are on Instagram to, to talk about the importance of, of breast health. We have launched um, what we call Black and Well TV, where we have conversations with notable influencers and celebrities and medical professionals and public health professionals to talk about the importance of early screening. It's you know, diver, delivered via uh, streaming. And um, we hope in the not too distant future to actually have a partnership where we can have a more national spokesperson convey this kind of information in the way Black women need to hear it in order to act on it so that they understand that this is important, but most importantly, that they don't need to be afraid. We're particularly concerned now that COVID-19 may actually keep women out of mammography centers and that, and that screening rates may go down. So we've gotta make sure that black women understand that it's still important to do and that there are safe ways to do it. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for your important advocacy. And uh, we do know that early detection works and it will save lives. So thank you for your important work. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. The gentlewoman yields back. Uh, it's a pleasure to recognize our colleague from California, uh, Mr. Cardenas for his five minutes of questions. Need to unmute Mr. Cardenas. Yes, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? 
I'm on. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member Burgess uh, for holding this important legislative hearing. Um, reauthorizing critical public health programs is very, very important to our country. And uh, I hope people understand that, that critical need, especially during this pandemic. And a big thank you to our witnesses. Really appreciate your expertise and your opinions today. Um, my first question has to do with um, uh, schools. So I'm gonna ask Mr. Boyd uh, a question. I'm a longtime supporter of the school-based health centers program, and I'm very glad to see us prioritizing legislation today to reauthorize this program that provides health care for 3.6 million youth, predominantly from low-income families. I'm very, very proud to say that I grew up in the uh, second largest school district in the country, and uh, the uh, school-based health clinic, I think it was the first one in the entire district, was at San Fernando High School, my high school. And what's really important in all aspects of healthcare is cultural competency, and especially when it comes to linguistic differences. So that school was very, uh, and that clinic that, that sponsored it, uh, was uh, very smart in hiring my brother, who was a clinical psychologist, a, a linguistic uh, and competent in two languages, Spanish and English, and also culturally competent as well. He grew up in that neighborhood, him and my 10 brothers and sisters went to that high school so he was able to really provide a service above and beyond what he learned in college uh, to get his degrees so i worry about the massive wave of behavioral health issues experts warn about when we're talking about this pandemic staying at home orders virtual learning and more uh, people having to educate their own children that in and of itself is is a, a big uh, issue these days uh, my question has to do with how could additional school-based health funding support students with mental health and substance use disorders? Like I said, my brother, psychologist, was at the school-based clinic, so it was mental and physical health provided there. Mr. Boyd? Yes, Congressman, you raised two important issues. One, access. The number of school-based health centers, from my perspective, from our organization's perspective, is unacceptable. There's fewer than 3,000 of us pre-pandemic, and we've got uh, 25,000 fully uh, eligible Title I schools. So we've got to grow the number. That then poses a human capital problem. We've, we can't take people out of, the, out of colleges and just throw them to work in school-based health centers. They've got to be licensed, certified, uh, trained professionals. So over the next 10 years, we have to address that human capital issue, and it has to address cultural competence. In, in seminary, I was always taught to look for the good news. The good news in the pandemic is that a lot of behavioral health specialists have said, okay, we accept the fact that telehealth is here to stay. Now the opportunity that that presents is how do we get uh, culturally competent um, mental health professionals to the schools that need them, potentially using telehealth. And that's something that a number of us are working on right now, trying to put together a strategy to bring to the federal agencies to say, we have the capability of doing this through telehealth. We've got to address the state licensing issues post pandemic. Right now, it's not as much of an issue, but you're right on point. Human capital is a number one issue as we look to expand the number of school-based health centers over the next 10 years. Thank you, Mr. Boyd. Uh, and I, I just wanna state for the record, tomorrow I'm introducing a bipartisan bill with some of my ENC colleagues to create a behavioral health technical assistance and training center for schools within SAMHSA. SAMHSA, for those who, don't, uh, who are viewing this, is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Uh, this would help schools and school systems better support students with mental health and substance use disorders. I hope this important legislation gains momentum and would welcome support from the School-Based Health Alliance. Mr. Boyd, what impact do you think COVID-19 will have on the health and well-being of our students? And also, how can we better help prepare you all to address this in the uh, coming school year? Yeah, it, it's a, like I said, it's a disaster. It, it's a disaster on the mental health side. It's, a, it's gonna be a disaster for the children that need daily um, uh, medicine management and behavioral health services. Um, we need more of us. The opportunity using telehealth is a great one because the cost of, of, of privacy protected platforms have come down and the cost of equipment that primary care providers use has come down literally 90% in the last 18 months. 
where it was $23,000 a unit this time last year, it's $2,300 a unit for that primary care equipment. So, you know, to those of you on energy and commerce that are also on communications, turning to the FCC and saying, use some of the universal services fund to enable us to buy that equipment and provide those platforms through school-based health centers um, is critical. We need those resources. We simply don't have them. It's one thing to get reimbursed, but if you don't have the capacity to be there and you don't have the trained professionals to serve, it's not going to matter. We've got to have the equipment. We've got to have that kind of funding. Thank you, Mr. Boyd. Madam Chair, if you'll allow me a, a point of personal privilege about our colleague, Ms. Brooks. Um, I, I agree with your sentiments. Sad to see her leave. And I just want to quote my two-year-old granddaughter who's bilingual. Uh, every time I leave, uh, she touches me by saying, no te vayas, no te vayas. That is, don't go, don't go. Take care. That's beautiful. Thank you. And uh, uh, the gentleman uh, yields back. Uh, pleasure to recognize the gentleman from Montana, Mr. Gianforte, for his five minutes of uh, question. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. I... I'm, sorry oh. I'm sorry. I need to withdraw that. Uh, I was wrong. Uh, Mr. Mullen, our colleague from Oklahoma. I'm sorry, I apologize to you, Mark. Uh, you know, for five minutes. Madam Chair, thank you so much. I promise you. Well, Madam Chair, thank you so much. I would have, uh, I would have grad grad gladly yield to, uh, to hopefully the next governor of Montana, Greg Giaforte. Uh, but uh, I, I got to say this, Tony, you said that you hate to see Susan go. I am mixed feelings because I don't want her to go, but at the same time, I, I get to move up on the diocese. She does, so. I <laughs> I'm kind of mixed on this one. Uh, no, I, I, I thank you so much for having this important hearing, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Goodman, I, my question is going to be referred to you. And, and I just got to, sh reading your story uh, about your son, I, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate you, you continuing, and even a decade later, advocating for these important causes. Literally, uh, I just ran out of where I'm staying temporarily. I'm not even at my house or in the office because my son had a a major brain injury and I had to just drop him off with specialists at the Center for Neural Skills in Bakersfield and ran back in here to, to answer questions. And, and uh, as you know, with pediatric care, there's a there's a disconnect between uh, adult care and pediatric care. What's available to, pediatric, to, to, to our children versus what's available to, uh, to adults um, and it, it's disproportionately wrong. And so I just want to tell you how much I appreciate your advocacy, but not just on medication, but on 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 uh, rehab and development and the encouragement of, of, of biotech companies to be involved in this in this area. So personally, Ms. Goodman, I just want to tell you, thank you so much uh, for, for being such an advocate for all of our kids. Um, in your testimony, you mentioned pediatric rare disease drug development is mostly done by small biotech companies, which is true. Can you comment on the how on how rare pediatric disease priority review voucher programs work uh, to get more uh, funding to these small uh, uh, inventors? Sure. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Congressman Mullen. And first of all, we are all keeping your sons in our uh, in our thoughts and our prayers for a you know a full and speedy recovery. Thank you. Um, so the, the voucher program is really critical for biotechs, many of which are thinly capitalized because the opportunity for them to create a voucher, um, it gives them a chance to uh, attract additional investors and even to sell their designation early in the drug development process and monetize the designation at you know, phase one or phase two as soon as they receive it so that they can use that funding for development of the drugs for kids who really need these novel therapies. Um, how, is a, how is a program funded to support the FDA uh, reviewers needed to review products on the expedited timeline? Do you, are you familiar with that? Yes, sir, thank you for that question. So every year the FDA calculates what the expense was to the FDA of this program and the FDA sets a new um, pediatric voucher user fee for the following year. And the current user fee is $2.1 million, and that's on top of the FDUFA user fee that a sponsor would pay, which is about $2.9 million. 
does does do you know if the program has a CBO score on either what it costs or what it saves the American taxpayers? Yes, the score is zero. And and I think which obviously I, I'm asking these questions, I know the answer, but I think a lot of people need to understand that that we're not we can invest in this without costing us anything because it, the the return and. Uh, and once again, your advocacy on this is 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 something that um, I think all every parent that has been through what you've been through uh, commend you on, and I just can't thank you enough. Uh, what measures does the FDA have in place to ensure that the safety and efficiency of these drugs go through uh, the expedited approval process? Um, so, sir, I think your question is, how can we be sure that the FDA approves drugs that are in a safe manner? Is that, yes. is that your question? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Look, I think that the people who choose to work at, this FDA, at the FDA are just smart and incredibly impassioned and dedicated people. Um, and they make sure that any drugs that they approve, you know, meet their rigorous standards. The targets they need to meet under this or any other DUFA program um, are not required. They're not mandatory on the FDA. They're optional. They're only FDA is only going to approve drugs if they're safe. Right, and and, and I, I once again know the answer to this, but uh, without congressional action, the pediatric rare disease priority review voucher is set to expire at the end of this year. What would that mean to to you and to to parents that are going through the same things that you went through? Thank you. You know, we've had um, almost two dozen new drugs for seriously ill kids uh, approved in the past um, eight years since the program was developed, and I think it's going to dry up. Right. Great. Well, uh, Ms. Goodman, thank you again uh, for your time and for being here. Madam Chair, thank you for uh, holding this important mm -hmm. meeting. With that, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, it's a pleasure to recognize uh, the gentleman from Maryland. Uh, Mr. Sarbanes for five minutes for his questions. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, appreciate um, all of the bills that we are discussing here today. Uh, again, very gratified that among them is the school-based health center reauthorization bill. And I want to thank my colleagues for their support of it and their interest uh, in the topic. And Mr. Boyd, I want to thank you for your a leadership at School Base a Health Alliance and the testimony that you've given us uh, today. I can say, having visited many, many school based health centers over the last few years, trying to understand all the dimensions in which they can provide support for, for children and families, um, that some of the most impressive practitioners uh, and health professionals I've ever met are the people that staff these. Uh, school-based health centers. Uh, the, the amount of support they give uh, to the school, to the students, to the families, and to the community really can't be overstated. So um, you're representing a, uh, a very proud and resourceful group of people, and we thank you for being with us uh, today. The school-based the school -based health centers, um, I kind of look at them as having two basic functions or opportunities. Uh, one is obviously to serve what is a captive audience, um, which are the children that are located uh, in that school, and to take full advantage of the fact that you have them there um, or that you're connected to them, if we look at it now through the lens of the pandemic and what that's doing to kind of change the status quo. Uh, but the other is that through children at, who, who come to these school-based health centers or are served by them, they act as a link to the families of those students and can help connect families to health care resources that are more broadly available. Sometimes that's through actual partnerships with community health clinics, including federally qualified health centers. Um, other times it's more through referral to other providers that are in the community. But uh, maybe you could speak a little bit to that, how the health centers in these schools can be a gateway of opportunity to access broader uh, health supports, whether it's physical health or mental health, emotional health, 
that are needed in those communities? That's a great question, Congressman. Um, Pre-pandemic, and I have to keep speaking of that because we don't know how many school-based health centers are going to have the resources to reopen. But pre-pandemic, the majority, over 51% of the school-based health centers were sponsored by federally qualified health centers. So that gave a tremendous link between uh, the family's health care and overall health care needs and addressing the health care needs of the of the uh, students. Uh, the NAC, the National Association of Community Health Centers, has identified and put in their strategic plan for this next year uh, an, an interest and, and a direction for federally qualified health centers to look more carefully at school-based health centers as an opportunity for them to expand their, their business models. Um, you, you you speak to the to the quality of the people in that work in the in the in the uh, school based health centers. Clearly, they could make more money. This is their calling. They're like teachers. They they're not there because it's the best paying job in the world. They're there because of their dedication and their commitment to serve, to in particular to serve children, and in particular to to serve children in low income communities because that's where most of the SBHCs are located. So yes, ab absolutely. And pre-pandemic, we were in process of arranging a, a, a visit for for us to go with you to to visit some of those centers in your district, and and hopefully we'll get the opportunity to do that in the future. Well, I look forward to that, and I appreciate very much your raising the issue of compensation for uh, those who staff the school-based um, health centers. Um, if you think about it. There's no more important position, given all of the different dimensions uh, that can be brought to bear by those professionals. Um, and we got to make sure that we recruit them um, with the opportunity to, you know, make a good living um, and that we keep them because that's critical as well, because they build relationships. Um, that was one of the most powerful uh, testimonies I got um, from a most recent visit to school based health center was the relationship that the, that center had built with certain students, oh, high, this was a high school, over the course of their time. And it meant when those students had issues and stresses, they felt like there was a place to turn, there was a relationship there. That's exactly what we need to provide for our young people. So thank you for your testimony. Um, we appreciate it very much and I yield my, my time back. Thank you, sir. Okay. The gentleman yields back. A uh, pleasure to recognize uh, the gentleman from Montana once again, <laughs> Mr. Gianforte. Five minutes. Before. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the committee meeting today uh, to advance several bipartisan reauthorization bills. Uh, as we know, we're reauthorizing the School Based Health Center program, a program to promote awareness and education about breast cancer in younger women the cord blood inventory and bone marrow transplant programs, and the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency. Uh, this is the entity that ensures that Olympic and Paralympic athletes are not using performance-enhancing drugs. I know we're all looking forward to having the Olympics next year and cheering for the Americans uh, that will be competing. Uh, the piece of legislation uh, we're working on today that I am most appreciative of is the Creating Hope Reauthorization Act. This bill reauthorizes the Rare Pediatric Disease Priority Review voucher, voucher Program. This program creates an incentive for drug companies to develop therapies for rare pediatric diseases. If we develop a therapy for one of these diseases affecting children, they get a voucher to speed the FDA review of another drug. Uh, this program has already led to the development of 22 therapies I've heard from Montanans dealing with the loss of their children from DP, DIPG, a currently untreatable brain tumor. Uh, DIPG is the second most common cause of child cancer deaths. Uh, encouraging more therapies and treatments uh, for these rare pediatric diseases is something we should all support. Uh, Ms. Goodman, uh, thank you for sharing your story with us today. And you were very articulate in your response to Mark Wayne Mullins uh, questions. Uh, is there anything else you would like to add about the reauthorization of this program and the, the impact it's been having uh, for uh, children in this country? Uh, thank you, Congressman Gianforte, for that question. 
I would just really like to just emphasize that this program has, as you said, 22 new drugs, many new drugs in the pipeline. The FDA has the opportunity to incorporate all of the costs of executing this program in their user fee. And so I hope we can find a way to um, reauthorize it on a permanent basis. Yeah, well, I think we have strong bipartisan support and you being here today and telling your story has had quite an impact. I wanna thank you for that. Uh, I look forward to supporting these pieces of legislation. And with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Uh, pleasure to recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Kennedy, for his five minutes questions. Madam Chair, thank you. And thank you for holding this important hearing as always. Mr. Boyd, in your testimony, you mentioned that it is still unclear how and if students will be able to go back uh, to in-person learning in the fall. It's a hard thing to balance uh, the importance of in-person education while also ensuring the health and safety for our children, their families, and their communities. Because opening schools will not just impact students, it impacts everyone around them. Because of this, we need to ensure that if schools do allow for in-person learning, we follow scientific guidelines, learn from other countries that either uh, began too soon or took a more strategic approach, and ensure that we have all the necessary stakeholders at the table in making these decisions. So Mr. Boyd, I wanna uh, ask you if you can talk a little bit about how you think school-based health centers should be involved in these decisions and the planning processes for the reopen. That's a great, great question. Thank you, Congressman. Um, we are part of a, a series of networks uh, in Washington that include all of the major organizations on the education side, including the unions, the superintendents, the principals, the, the, uh, and as well as on the, the health delivery side and the nurses, the counselors, the psychologists, the social workers, and us. Uh, everybody across the board sees the value of the work that we do. We don't see ourselves in competition with each other we see ourselves in full support of each other. Um, we're not sure how schools should open. We think that's a local decision that's gonna have to be made on a scientific basis, case by case. But again, I wanna come back to the point that schools are still, schools for the most part remained open. The question was the ability of the school to deliver their services. It was the buildings that closed. I don't think that most school districts today are looking necessarily at not reopening. They're looking at whether or not to reopen their buildings. School-based health centers have to be a part of that conversation. And we are at the, at the national level. It has to filter down to the district level. School districts can't put out plans that don't include parents and in some situations, students, as well as major employers in their communities, as well as all of the disciplines that I've that I've referenced. And I wanted to build on that a, a little bit, Mr. Boyd, um, because you spoke about um, the importance of mental health and emotional well-being of children during this pandemic. Um, and it's been a big area of focus of mine, as perhaps you know. Well, we've seen how the, the pandemic has highlighted the gaps in our own health system when it comes to mental health. Um, and now um, what had happened with the, the need to shelter in place with um, additional isolation and diminished peer connections and how they, that can negatively impact one's mental health. We've seen the devastating impacts of a far increased need for mental behavioral health services, increasing rates of suicide, longstanding racial inequities that still exist between Black, Native, and, and Latinx uh, children and families. So just walk me through how you're thinking of uh, providing, um, meeting that need for mental behavioral health services for our children and in our schools. Yeah, I, I, I think there's, there's several challenges. Telehealth does provide that opportunity. For many um, mental health care providers throughout this pandemic, that's been the telephone. And right. while, while children are less, uh, school children are less reluctant to do that kind of a telehealth visit, it's been the adults that have resisted it. And I think many have, have gotten past that. Our dilemma then is to make sure that we protect the privacy of those students. Mm -hmm. it's, it's to give them a greater opportunity to participate, but make sure that when they are participating, they're doing it in an environment that allows them to be honest and open without um, sharing confidences or, or 
the invasion of their privacy because someone's able to hear it or someone's able to hear the the healthcare provider on the other end. We've got to come up with with um, technological solutions and platforms that work for the kids, but also uh, protect their privacy and work for the for the um, uh, practitioners. That that's going to be the major challenge and the major opportunity for us going forward if we wind up in a in this situation for an extended period of time as it, it seems we're going to right. we're going to have to use technology um uh, time is limited so i'll um i might follow up with a, a question for the record for you but i'm grateful for your time uh and uh, your willingness to highlight these issues as we try to navigate our way through forward thank you very much sir at your Feel convenience sir. Uh, the gentleman yields back uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Bill Arrakis, for his five minutes of questions. Are you unmuted, Mr. Bill Arrakis? Mr. Bill Arrakis, you need to unmute. I guess if I sing it, it doesn't make any difference, right? Let's see. How are we going to get his attention? Unmute. Looks like he's trying to unmute. Why don't, uh, let's see if we have, um, why don't we go to uh, Congressman uh, Ruiz of California and then circle back with Mr. Bill Arrakis because I think he, has some um, uh, technological issues there. Okay. Uh, Somebody's laughing. I don't know. My good friend Gus, uh, you're gonna have to go get a staffer to help you. <laughs> I've been there. It's a it's a it's a uh, black hole for sure. Uh, so thank you everybody for being here. School based health centers are essential for many families in my district and around the country. I grew up in an underserved community with poor access to healthcare. It's a farm worker community of Coachella, California. In fact, my alma mater, Coachella Valley High School, has a school-based health center. While some of these quote unquote health centers uh, consist of one exam room, limited supplies, and are often in a tiny trailer on campus, there are, they are critical to a child's health and well-being providing services such as dental prevention and treatment, health education, mental health services, and preventative health screenings. Not only that, but they are also serve the families of the students, providing important continuity of care within the family. Students and their families rely on school-based health centers for their health care because oftentimes that is the only access to health care that the family has. These facilities tend to serve families and otherwise underserved areas where health disparities are acute, where people might not have insurance or maybe can't find a doctor who takes uh, Medicaid or can't take off work in the middle of a Tuesday to take their child to the doctor. School-based health centers fill this need and they are critical to families who have limited access to care. Uh, my question to Mr. Boyd, how do school-based health centers address health equity and the needs of underserved children and adolescents? Thank you, Congressman. You raised three important issues. And, and the first one I'm gonna to speak to is, is the, the infrastructure. The average age of a public school building in the United States of America is north of 50 years. I've built a lot of buildings in my life. And the, uh, the guts, the, the roofing systems, the HVAC, et cetera, are built with a 20 to 30 year life. So they're holding them together with nothing. The reason you probably had a trailer was there was no room in the school building for them to put that school-based health center, but they really wanted one. Um, the other issue you raise is, is access. And I'm, I'm a believer that if you took all of the rural schools in America and you put them into one school district, you'd probably have the poorest school district in America. So even if there was a desire to, to to build out space for that school-based health center in your community, they probably did not have the resources. The pandemic has given us an interesting opportunity, technology, to be able to expand the reach 
and and beam into that trailer other kinds of services that might not be available readily in the community is is a unique one for this this time that we're in. Uh, that's why I say to those of you that that sit on the communications subcommittee, make the FCC give us money for telehealth. It's critical. Thank if you. If we're going to continue to serve and expand, it's Thank all you, about what Linda Blount said. It's all about equity. Thank you, Mr. Boyd. You said in your testimony that there is an intersection between education and health. What are the health outcomes of uh, of these centers, and can you expound on the correlation between health and education outcomes? I, I love when, thank you for that. I, I love when people ask questions that other people have answered. Uh, included in your written testimony is a, is a document from the Community Preventative Services Task Force uh, of the CDC, and they uh, list uh, access to all of their findings, but they point out two major ones. School-based health centers led to improved educational outcomes, including school performance, grade, performance, grade promotion, and high school completion. School-based health centers also led to improved health outcomes, including the delivery of vaccinations and other recommended preventative services, and decreases in asthma morbidity and emergency department and hospital admission rates. That's very interesting because oftentimes in poor communities, the rate of asthma is high, and that's particularly true in my desert rural community with farm workers. Uh, it seems like uh, a lot of people will refer to cost effectiveness of these programs. Uh, are there any data that shows the cost effectiveness of these school-based health centers? I may have to get back to you on that one. Understand that school-based health centers don't cost the schools any money. They are reimbursed by Medicaid. And, and oftentimes, if that child is not being seen by a school-based health center, they may not be seen by anybody. They're not necessarily going to the, the local federally qualified health center or to a to, a, to an independent pedi pediatrician. Well, I think we can agree that if we have uh, preventative services, mental health services that we provide uh, in the schools efficiently, then it lowers healthcare costs overall in the long run. Absolutely. Healthy kids grow up to be healthy adults and are less of a drain on, on our financial system. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Uh, let's circle back to our wonderful colleague, uh, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Bill Arrakis. Are you unmuted? Can you hear me? Now I can. Okay, now we can. very Let's good. Yeah, we. I had to switch to uh, my iPhone because the computer was not working. I did unmute several times, and I apologize for that, Madam Chair. Uh, many of you know that the National uh, Marrow Donor Registry was established more than 30 years ago by a former colleague and friend, Bill Young. You mentioned that, uh, Madam Chair. What a wonderful man. Actually, my district was adjacent to his. He was passionate about this program and often said, it was his proudest accomplishment in Congress. That's saying something. Because of Bill Young and, of course, Chris Miss, uh, his passion from uh, the gentleman from New Jersey, I'm familiar with the work of the National Registry. However, what I didn't realize until I met with uh, Mr. Lindbergh earlier this year is the special requirement that bone marrow must be hand carried by volunteer couriers from donor to a patient. Because of this perishability, there are serious time constraints. Many times, mail travelers, uh, mail travelers internationally. So again, the question is for Mr. Lindbergh, by the way, an outstanding job in your presentation today, sir. Uh, the question is, can you discuss the challenges this creates for the program, especially during this uh, pandemic? Please, thank you. Mr. Bilirakis, thank you. Thank you for co-sponsoring HR 4764 and for picking up the torch that Mr. Young lit. Uh, we appreciate that so very much. Uh, yes, as you can imagine, the global pandemic has um, has created incredible barriers for us, uh, obstacles that perhaps back in March I, I wasn't sure we were going to be able to overcome. But I'm so I'm so proud of my colleagues who have done incredible work to make sure that that no patients have 
have missed their transplant. Uh, I will share briefly, only anecdotally, uh, things like Mr. Belarakis, uh, there was a, a donor in the country of Colombia. Um, that donor, because of inability to collect her cells in Colombia, needed to get to the United States. We needed to get her to the United States in a matter of days. I will share um, only briefly that on a on a Saturday afternoon at two o'clock, I was told by an embassy official, Brian, it's impossible. This can't. We we are not going to be able to make this work in time. And by ten o'clock that evening, we had the authorization for her to leave the country. We were we had the authorizations to open up a a closed airport. Um, we brought in a private aircraft and flew this young woman out of the country of Colombia. She flew to your home state, Mr. Bilarakis, and donated her bone marrow um, just a couple of days later in time for that patient's life to be saved. Um, so yes, this has been an incredibly trying time, but I have been so uh, thankful for my colleagues and frankly, the support of you, your colleagues and the federal government agencies in allowing us to make that happen. Well, that shows you we should never give up. And I know Harry Glenn has been working on this as well. He's the former chief of staff uh, for Bill Young. So uh, let me go on to the next question. As referenced previously, the Nonpartisan Government Accountability Office stated in their January 2020 report on priority review vouchers that all seven drug developers we speak to indicated that the vouchers were a factor in their decision. So this question is for Ms. Goodman. Uh, the bottom line, as a patient advocate, do you believe the rare pediatric PRV program has been effective at incentivizing the development of new target therapy and immuno, uh, immunotherapy drugs for rare pediatric cancers to extend and save lives and provide hope to pediatric patients and their families? If so, can you also describe for this committee what would occur if this program failed to be reauthorized or reauthorized permanently? That's the question, and these are all great bills. I tell you what, this is a wonderful hearing. We hope we we put them in uh, markup in September. But uh, anyway, if you could answer, Ms. Goodman, I'd appreciate that very much. Thank you so much, Congressman Bill Arrakis, and thank you for your support on this bill um, throughout the past 10 years. Look, the uh, evidence that the program is successful um, goes from the 22 drugs that have been approved since it was passed, to the over 60 drugs in the development pipeline for seriously ill kids. You know, we don't want to lose this opportunity by letting this program lapse. And by making it permanent, we can hit the one area that we haven't, uh, where we haven't maximized the incentive. And that is at the very earliest stage of drug development. When drug developers say, am I going to develop a drug for seriously ill kids? They need to know the voucher is going to be out there whenever they get the drug approved so that they can um, develop those drugs for kids. Thank you. Thank you. A uh, question for Mr. Lindbergh. For many diseases, including blood cancers and sickle cell anemia, cellular therapy offers the best hope for a cure. Questions for Mr. Lindbergh. Has the calculated need for unrelated cellular transplants, in other words, non-family members, increased? If so, what demographic has seen the largest increase in need? If you can share that with the committee, I would really appreciate it. Thanks, Mr. Bilirakis. I'll do that with Pace here. Yes, we, we know as uh, the number of diseases that are treatable by bone marrow transplant, peripheral blood stem cell transplant, and other cell therapies increases, the need um, thereby increases as well. And we know that our, um, our largest obstacles are making sure that as we come, become more and more diverse as a country, that we're able to serve more and more diverse patients uh, through more and more uh, members of our registry of, uh, of varying ethnic descents that are willing to step up and make those donations. Thank you very much. Uh, I think my time has expired, Madam Chair. Is that correct? It, yeah, your time has so. expired, and uh, the thank you very much. Appreciate yields it. back. Glad you got the. Um, uh, yeah, we got it straightened out. Got it all straightened out there. Uh, okay, uh, it's a pleasure to recognize the very patient. Gentlewoman from New Hampshire, um, uh, Congresswoman Custer, for your five minutes of questions. Wonderful to be with you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sure. I want, uh, can you hear me? 
we're good? Yeah. yeah. Good. Uh, it's a very important discussion and thank you for hosting this, uh, this hearing today. While this committee has been keenly focused on the coronavirus pandemic, there are many public health programs that we need to continue to support. And one of those is school-based health centers. So I'm a proud co-sponsor of HR 2075, introduced in uh, by my colleague, Congressman Sarbanes. These health centers are critical in providing comprehensive care, including care to identify at-risk students before they develop substance dependence and addiction. In New Hampshire and communities across the country, we're battling two crises, the opioid epidemic and the COVID-19 epidemic. In fact, preliminary data shows that COVID is worsening pre-existing issues with substance misuse, and the current pandemic and resulting economic downturn are exacerbating behavioral health risk factors such as social isolation and stress. Prior to COVID-19, I heard from teachers regarding the generational effects of the opioid epidemic and how children cope with adverse childhood events or ACEs outside of their home. As the COVID-19 pandemic continues, how can school-based health centers ensure that we continue to address adverse childhood events closer to the occurrence of the event, which increases the ability to treat an acute condition before it becomes chronic? And I'm asking Mr. Boyd if you could speak to the role of school-based health centers in nurturing age-appropriate resilience that's helpful to mitigate self-medication and to further substance use disorders in early adulthood. Yeah, this is another great question. Um, we work very closely with youth as well. We have a youth advisory committee that that you know feeds into our programmatic work, and actually a, a part of a, one of our federal grants is to is to to work with the youth. The dilemma right now, as you know, is that the pandemic has exponentially um, grown potentially the abuse and use of of alcohol and drugs. We've seen it in liquor store sales. We don't have you know good numbers on any increases in sales of of, of opioids in particular. Um, our, our need right now is to get the school-based health centers that we have reopened and to expand that reach. Part of expanding that reach is also expanding the services that are offered and, and substance abuse services are critical in school-based environments. One of our uh, my time is limited. I'm sorry to have to cut no you problem. off. I really find this very important, and I want to support you and your work and your colleagues yeah. all across the country, including here. Another program I want to focus on is the USADA, United States Anti Doping Agency, recognized by Congress as the national anti doping organization for our Olympic community. And I am the niece and cousin of Olympic uh, alpine ski racers. And I wanted to ask you, Mr. Tigert, in your testimony, you discuss a culture change in terms of the way the United States was perceived on the international sports stage. Can you talk about this shift and why it's so important for youth when they look up to Olympic athletes to know that they are drug free? Yes, ma'am, and thank you for the question. Well, it, it's absolutely critical to have true heroes today, and we may be more desperate today uh, in the world of sport than we ever have been to have people that our young kids can look up to and try to emulate and attempt to become. And so when Congress set up an independent organization to ensure that the fox was no longer guarding the hen house, what it did was gave confidence to athletes that this independent organization is not there just to promote them, but is there to ensure that they follow the rules. And, and we know whether a young person becomes an Olympic athlete and becomes one of those heroes or goes into any other you know, industry or career in their life outside of sport, the, the lessons they learn on the playing field are important life lessons that they'll take with them. And respecting the rule of law, respecting, yes, we want to win, but we want to win the right way is, is absolutely essential. And our athletes today you know, short 20 years ago since we were established have embodied that notion and are truly the heroes that we want them to be. Not to say that some won't attempt to cut the rules, but we're here to have a fair program that ensures that their decision to do a ride is enforced. 
Well, my time is up, but I can certainly say as a parent, I appreciate the role that you play and thank you again. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Jowell Woman yields back. Uh, it's a pleasure to recognize the only pharmacist in the co uh, Congress, <coughs> my colleague, uh, Mr. Carter from Georgia, five minutes. Since. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you everyone for being on this call. This is um, this is certainly important. I want to start with you, Ms. Goodman. Um, there are those who have um, been somewhat critical, if you will, of the rare pediatric disease priority review voucher and have said that it hasn't been successful in, in achieving what it was intended to. You cited some figures, um, I believe, when, when Congressman Mullins was, was asking you some questions. Could you repeat those and the number of drugs that have come out as a result of the um, PRV and, and, and what, how you would respond to those claims, those critics who say that it hasn't um, operated like it should have? Sure. You know, there have been 22 new drugs approved by the FDA. That's a very high bar approval since the program was enacted in 2012. Um, I think that's pretty good proof that the program has been successful. How was it before the program? Can you compare it before and after? Sure. Well, in the case of pediatric cancer, which is not all rare diseases, of course, there had only been two drugs approved expressly for kids with cancer in the 25 years leading up to the Creating Hope Act enactment. Um, okay. We just couldn't get funding. Good, but the, the obviously the program has helped. Obviously, we've seen results. The program has helped with small biotechs, with academics who want to get their ideas out into industry. It's just really been a very successful program. Well, let's, staying on that on the program itself and in the the vouchers that are that, that get the priority review by the FDA and allowing them to be completed in six months. Um, do you have any evidence that any of the drugs approved with the voucher under this program have have had to be pulled from the market because it was unsafe? Um, have you seen any instances instances of that of all, at all? So that's a terrific question, Congressman Carter. I'm going to have to get back to you on specifics, um, but I will say that you know because of the voucher program, because of the, um, because of the user fees charged for this program and for PDUFA. FDA has been able to almost double um, the number of employees working at the FDA and reviewing drug approvals from 2008 until now. So we really have so many more people, so much more FDA technology and better management practices reviewing these drugs. I really trust the FDA not to be um, do a quick and dirty job. I really trust them to only approve drugs that are safe. Well, you know, I'm one who believes, and listen, I, as was mentioned earlier, as a practicing pharmacist for over 30 years, I, I've seen this and I've dispensed some of these medications. And I, I can tell you that they are needed and we need to in, need to improve the, the process by which they are approved. And, and, and certainly, you know, we, we still need to be careful. There's no question about that, but I'm still one who believes that, you know, no longer how long the, no, no matter how long the process is, it's you still run that risk. There will be some that, and I've seen it over my years of practice of drugs that have gone through a thorough review that regardless of how good a review it was, we had to pull them from the market at some, at some point. And that's going to happen, but to keep them from getting on the market, I think is, is a, is far worse than, than what we've experienced. Um, Dr. Kesselham, are, are you still with us? Yes. I am. I'm happy do, to do you, Yeah. It, it, do you, um, have you seen any instances where any drugs have been, have had to be pulled back as a result of this um, accelerated uh, approval program? Yes, there was a study that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine about a decade ago that said that drugs that are approved within uh, a short period of time just before the FDA approval deadline were in were more likely to be pulled from the market, were more likely to have boxed warnings added to it or other safety related information added to it. And I think that study shows that if you impose arbitrarily fast deadlines on, on reviews, that that can increase the risk of those kinds of things happening again. I agree it doesn't happen very often and we want to try to, but we want to try to minimize it happening as much as possible. The FDA doesn't approve drugs 
when the FDA approves the drugs, it doesn't mean the drug is safe. It just means that the drug's benefits outweigh its risks. And we have a lot more to learn about those risks once the drug hits the market. Now, I'm not going to dispute what you just said, but again, as a practicing pharmacist for over 30 years, I can tell you I've witnessed where no matter how long the review is, you're still going to have those instances. And I do think that the risk does outweigh or, or the benefits do outweigh the risk in this particular case. That's why I do hope that the program is permanently uh, renewed and, and, and that we can move on from there. And Madam Chair, I see I'm out of time and I will yield back. Thank you both. Thank you all. Uh, the gentleman yields back. Thank you for your good questions. Um, pleasure to recognize uh, the gentlewoman from Delaware, uh, Ms. Um, Rochester, Blunt Rochester. And thank you for your patience. Thank you. Thank you, Chairwoman. And uh, thank you so much to all of our witnesses today. Um, as a co-sponsor of H.R. 2075, the School-Based Health Centers Reauthorization Act, H.R. 4078, the Early Act Reauthorization, and H.R. 4439, the Creating Hope Reauthorization Act, I'm glad that the subcommittee is taking the opportunity to discuss legislation that would reauthorize a number of critically important public health programs. Delaware leads the nation in rates of triple negative breast cancer, an aggressive form of cancer that disproportionately affects young African-American women. In fact, a 2019 study found that more than 21% of black women were diagnosed with triple negative cancer compared to 11% for all other types of breast cancer. And women under the age of 40 had twice the odds of a triple negative breast cancer diagnosis than women aged 50 to 64 years. Ms. Blunt, what are the unique challenges that young Black women face in finding out about this type of cancer and what their risks might be? Oh, thank you, Congresswoman. You, you actually highlight a very serious concern that we have in, in breast cancer as we think about what we can do to, to reduce our risk. Um, the, the number one challenge is information, is understanding their own risk, understanding their family history, understanding the need to go in for screening mammography, and being in a system where their providers are likely to ask certain questions and then make those recommendations. So this is, this is really critical. The other really important point is we don't quite understand why Black women have twice the rates in some states, as you mentioned, in Delaware and others, nationally about 30% more, um, triple negative breast cancer. We need to do a large study to understand that. Um, and I understand a, a large randomized control trial will take years. We need to do that. But in the meantime, what we need to make sure is that Black women get screened early, because we know even if it's triple negative breast cancer, if we catch it in its earliest stages, Black women can have wonderful outcomes and die of old age and not from breast cancer. So the important thing is to make sure that they know to get in and get screened early. Yeah, thank you so much. And in your testimony, you also talked about access to the latest breast, uh, digital breast screening technologies. Um, how does the Early Act improve access to better diagnostic care and what more can Congress do to reduce disparities in access in addition to the incredible work that you're doing? Well, the, the Early Act makes sure that, that women understand their risk, understand the need for screening mammography, gets to providers so the providers understand that. But the important thing is Black women tend to have dense breast tissue. And so if they have a lesion, 2D or standard film mammography is less likely to pick it up mm -hmm. as, as compared with 3D or tomosynthesis. So as, as a part of that education program for providers and for women to help them understand that if they have a choice, try to find a facility that will provide 3D mammography is gonna be much better for them, more likely to pick up their cancer, more likely to pick it up early when it can be treated. Thank you, thank you so much for your work. And uh, I wanna shift qu uh, my questions to Dr. Boyd. Um, I had the opportunity to serve over almost 30 years ago as a policy advisor to our current Senator, Tom Carper, who at the time was our governor. 
and he had a vision for making sure that every school in our state had a wellness center. Um, we started off with all of the high schools, and now today I can report that every public non-charter high school operates a wellness center in the, in the state and is looking to expand to uh, elementary and middle schools. Uh, Dr. Boyd, how do early intervention services provided by elementary school wellness centers help improve health outcomes throughout a child's life and save health care dollars? That great, great question. And 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 uh, Delaware has an extraordinary program. I'm a former Delaware resident, so I'm I'm very appreciative of it. Um, f first, it gets the students used to understanding it's just health, tearing down the barriers so that they they're comfortable and and confident in interacting with healthcare professionals and learning to look after their health and speak up when there are issues addressing those. But, but two, that, that CDC guide I pointed to, um, we know that it has significant impact on the academic performance of the students. Time on task, it keeps them in front of the, in front of the, uh, the, the, the classroom longer, they're not having to leave school, and it solves the problem for the parent, often women, often low income, that have to leave an hourly job to go take that child to a doctor. Nine times out of 10, it doesn't happen. Yeah, thank so, you so much. Critical. Thank you so much, Dr. Boyd. And uh, also the mental health aspect of it is so important, especially now more than ever. Thank you. I yield back, Madam Chairwoman. The gentlewoman yields back. Uh, it's a pleasure to recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush, for his five minutes of questions. You need to unmute. Unmute. Uh and thank you for that uh, gentle reminder to unmute. Uh, Ms. Gorler uh, Blount, I want to thank you for the work that your organization does for uh, black women and girls all around this nation. As a cancer survivor myself, it's heartening to hear uh, the, pro uh, the progress uh, that's being made to prevent unnecessary death uh, among black women from cancer. <clears throat> As I listen to your testimony, the parallels to a heart disease uh, were overwhelming. As I'm sure you know, more than 60% of black women are not aware that heart disease is their number one health threat. <clears throat> I recently wrote to the National Institutes of Health asking that they create a Black Women's Healthy Heart Program, which would focus directly on increasing awareness among Black women of both the risk of and the prevention tools available for heart disease. Uh, what best practices, Ms. Gola Block, from your work on raising breast cancer awareness could be applied to heart disease awareness, particularly for black women. Well, thank you, Congressman Rush. Um, you, you raise a very important point. Um, heart disease is the number one killer, and a lot of us don't know that. Um, and heart disease is an issue of both lifestyle and circumstances. So the things that we know, for example, my organization, the Black Women's Health Imperative, has a program called Change Your Lifestyle, Change Your Life, which was originally conceived as diabetes prevention, but the risk factors for diabetes and heart disease and hypertension are the same. And so we start with managing stress and how you eat, why you eat, what, you, what emotionally you bring to eating, and active, uh, active living, moving around. We know if women can manage their stress, particularly the black women, manage their stress and have access to fresh fruits and vegetables and ha can get physical activity, this can significantly reduce their rates for all chronic diseases. And we also know that about 70% of chronic disease mortality is completely avoidable. So what we need are programs like this program um, implemented across the country, and we're in 12 states right now, and to partner with the CDC on its um, chronic disease awareness program to make sure women understand what they can do and that, in fact, they can do things. And to your point, if women 
can manage their stress, their diet, and their physical activity, that also lowers their, their risk for breast cancer. Right. Uh, Mr. Moran and also uh, uh, Ms. Gola uh, Blunt, this pandemic, uh, the coronavirus, in my, my, in my opinion, gives us an extraordinary opportunity to completely <clears throat> reimagine and, and revitalize and recreate a public health system. Uh, do you agree? And what are some of the things that this Congress should be doing in order to really just create a whole new perspective, reimagining what public health uh, the public health system could mean to uh, to all Americans, particularly the least of these. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, our public health response was was not in any way sufficient. Um, we, what we need to do is listen to scientists. What we could have done to prevent where we are now with COVID nineteen is to reflect back forty years with HIV. We needed to do testing. We needed to do contact tracing and follow up. We can still do that now. But what we've got to do is make sure that people have access to resources, that we're reaching out to people with the mm -hmm. kinds of information and resources they need. Thank and you. To make sure our providers and researchers Thank are involved in the conversation. Thank you. Mr. Moore, can you chime in with the few seconds that I have remaining? Yes, Congressman. Access, access, access. People of low income don't have access to adequate care. It's that simple. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back and thank him for his excellent questions. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, recognize the gentlewoman from California, very patient, uh, Ms. Barrigan, for your five minutes of questions. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you to all our panelists today. Um, I appreciate the conversation and um, want to go back to to continue to highlight the issue of breast cancer disparities that, that we continue to see. As with many other health conditions plaguing our communities, there are significant and unacceptable health disparities when it comes to breast cancer. Uh, my own sister uh, got breast cancer at an early age, so it continues to be a concern. And in our communities, um, it's something that I don't hear of talked about a lot. Um, Ms. Blunt, as you have mentioned in your testimony, you know, African American women are almost 40% more likely uh, to die from breast cancer compared to non Hispanic white women. In part, I think that's because there are screened less frequently. They're more likely to have advanced disease when a diagnosis is made and have less, less access uh, to medical care. Um, you, you just mentioned something that I don't think a lot of people hear about the 3D mammography of availability. Is that something that a community clinic would have available if, uh, let's say, I told my constituents to ask about it, or is that something they would have to have more advanced access to um, a different level of healthcare? Yeah, thank you for that question, uh, Congresswoman. Right now, most, 3D mammography is available in upper income areas, I'll just be honest with you, in suburban areas. And we need to make sure that all women have access to 3D mammography. That is a critically, particularly um, black women, Latinas, particularly women who are gonna have dense, dense breast tissue. We have to make it more available. As Mr. Boyd said, access is critical. I do wanna highlight one point, the screening rates actually between black and white women are about the same, both annually and biannually. The problem is black women tend to get their cancers det detected much later. So while about 60% of us are screening every year, our cancers don't get diagnosed un until much later because we tend to wait later. So if we had access and we were screening at, at the same rates, our outcomes would be much better. Well, thanks for pointing that out because I think the what you just said about what's available in the upper income areas versus the lower income areas goes to the disparities that we face and the, the really the different access to care that people have um, in this country. Um, can you elaborate on how the early act um, may help reduce the intolerable disparities that we're seeing in this area? 
I can. We, we've seen over the last 10 years, um, particularly among younger women, a slight uptick in screening rates. I mean, we've gone from about annual from about you know, 58 percent to 62 percent. So I'm going to um, uh, declare success. But what the act will do is make sure women understand the importance of screening mammography and, and most importantly, that they don't need to be afraid of it. Then, you know, women aren't being recommended, but also women are afraid to be screened. They're afraid, what happens if I have a breast cancer? And the fact is, you know, screening doesn't impact your, whether or not you're gonna develop breast cancer, but it can impact how well you'll do if a breast cancer is detected. So the early act is critical to help women understand that they need to get in early, starting at age 40, screen every year, and that if it so happens a breast cancer gets detected, you've had this experience, it can be treated in its earliest stages when outcomes are excellent. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, the National Cancer Institute has also found that social economic status factors like access to education, access to health insurance, living conditions, including exposure to environmental uh, toxins are associated with an individual's or a group's risk of developing and surviving cancer. I have been advocating for investments in these social determinants of health, including introducing a bill called the Improving Social Determinants of Health Act, which would give the CDC resources to invest in communities to tackle these issues. This would help lower health what will actually help improve health outcomes, especially for those who are low income and living in underserved communities. Um, can you discuss how investing in social determinants of health can help reduce the rate of breast cancer in underserved communities and also lead to better outcomes? Yes, I can. Thank you. And that's an important point. Um, social determinants covers a variety of things from, from community to neighborhood to food to transportation, housing. One of the things we can do is by focusing on social determinants is actually lower our risk. And another issue is to understand how our environmental factors impact our, our whether or not we're going to develop disease. And critically, and I have to come back to this, access. Social determinants of health are the leading impediment to access to, to health care of any kind. Great. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, the gentlewoman yields back. Uh, it's a pleasure to recognize the gentleman from Ohio, uh, Mr. Johnson, who has, I believe, waved on to our subcommittee today and one of the authors of uh, uh, the bills that we're taking up. Well, thank you, Madam Chairwoman I, uh, and Mr. Ranking Member for the opportunity to wave on to the Health Subcommittee today in support of H.R. 5373, the United States Anti-Doping Agency Reauthorization Act. Uh, Mr. Tiger, it's good to see you again as well. Uh, thanks for your decades of tireless work to make USADA the gold standard across the world for its anti-doping efforts. You know, this bipartisan legislation, which I'm proud to sponsor, along with my colleague, uh, Congresswoman DeGette, will reauthorize funding for USADA, improve education to youth sports uh, and for both programs and coaches, and includes provisions to direct federal law enforcement to coordinate with USADA to combat the trafficking and illicit use of performance enhancing drugs. With the Summer Olympics in Tokyo next year uh, and the return of the Olympics to the United States in 2028 in Los Angeles, it's critical that USADA has the resources it needs to continue its work. So Mr. Tiger, as we heard in your testimony, it is essential that America takes the global lead in anti-doping and clean sports. In the past, this has not always been the case. Can you explain the benefit to the standing of the United States abroad when we can demonstrate that our athletes compete and win the right way? Thank you, Congressman Johnson. Really appreciate the question. And you're absolutely right. Um, the U.S. for the rule of law. We're a democracy that is functions when um, all of us who agree to a set of rules uh, that are designed to provide certain benefits for those that follow the rules and ensure that equality can be provided in the athletic context, context for our athletes who are competing. And so when the United States 
um, sends athletes around the world and they demonstrate that. I think there's no better example of the values that this country stands for, that our athletes uh, abide by the rule of sport. They compete healthy, they compete clean, and you can actually look at them as the role models that they are and that they represent this great country in the values that we espouse around the world like no other instrument we we almost have and and that's kind of like they're it's kind of like they're ambassadors right it's it's absolutely right and and not just to win but importantly win the right way and and that's the difference between our athletes today and what the world saw back in the in the late 90s when the the speculation and there was some evidence to suggest it um, when our system was so poor that our athletes weren't winning the right way. Um, today, they know they're being held to the highest standards and that they can have great confidence when they go and, and win medals at the games and represent this country that they're doing it the right way. Sure. Well, what does it mean uh, for global sports more broadly to have an organization that does things the right way like USADA does and, and doesn't operate under malign influences like we've seen with uh, countries like Russia and others. It's critically important that that independent model has become a beacon to, to many around the world. And I think has demonstrated as my written testimony that I submitted indicates has, has shown, I mean, two whistleblowers inside of Russia, all the benefits of the independent model and specifically USADA's work. And it motivated them and said, there are people um, outside of Russia, despite what they were being told, that do stand for these values, that the rules matter, that integrity in sport matters. And, and it motivated them and inspired them to come forward and ultimately expose a state that was abusing its own athletes, as we saw in the state-sponsored doping scandal that's been exposed now um, dealing with, with Russia. So it is a beacon to many around the world that winning the right way is the only way to play. Okay. Well, you know, I mentioned youth sports. You know, I've got a teenage son, Nathan, who's a competitive high school swimmer. And he has his dream set on swimming in college and, and maybe even beyond. He, he's really very good. I'm a little biased. I'm his dad, but, but I think <laughs> he's really, really good. His times sure reflect that. But he looks up to our incredible uh, Olympians and is looking forward to watching them compete in Tokyo next year. Can you explain how USADA's work is essential for the next generation of top athletes? Why? taking early action on educating them on the importance of competing fairly and ensuring clean, drug-free sports in the future, why that's so important? Well, it's critically important, and, and you should have confidence that you're, he, he does have a number of role models that he can, he can watch and, and be proud of and, and attempt to emulate. And, and can you imagine um, a young athlete, you know, first grade, second grade, as they're growing up, one day dreaming of making it to the elite level, only then to realize they have to inject themselves with dangerous performance enhancing drugs. You know, no, nobody goes into sport for that reason. And that's why to protect the value of sport, whether he ultimately becomes an Olympic level swimmer or just goes into another profession, doing it the right way is the only way. And our programs to educate, but also provide true role models for him. Are critically important to his his future Thank success. Time. Christmas time has expired. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I yield. Thank you, and we share your pride in your son, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Thank you. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to recognize uh, the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. O'Halloran, uh, for his five minutes of questions, and I believe he is the last member, uh, unless someone. Um, walks on and I see them on the screen. So, Mr. O'Halloran, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and uh, thank you also, Ranking Member, for allowing me to wave on. Um, th this, uh, this issue it speaks to a really important issue in rural America, not only in Arizona, but throughout America. And uh, school-based health centers provide a wide variety of essential health services to students and their families, many of whom lack health insurance and otherwise would have no ability to see a medical provider. School-based health centers can treat chronic conditions like asthma and provide preventative services like immunization and physical examination. School-based health centers play a critical role 
and providing care to children and families, families throughout Arizona. In fact, according to the Arizona School-Based Health Alliance, 45% of school-based health centers are located in rural areas. Rural America already is suffering from a lack of access to high quality and affordable health care. Additionally, 82% of the children who use the services are uninsured. That is why school-based health centers, the Authorization Act of 2019, is so critical. I fear that if Congress fails to act, many children will lose access to the important services provided by these centers. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed what those of us in rural America already know. Many of us lack affordable access to high quality health care. In particular, I'm concerned about the mental health care of students and families whose lives have been upended and whose social structure has completely changed in light of COVID-19. Dr. Boyd, uh, thank you for your testimony here today and for all the work that you and your members do. Uh, in our testimony, you taught your testimony, you talked quite a bit about the importance of reimbursing mental health of our students and remembering it. What changes have you and your members already seen in the mental health of our students given the COVID-19 situation? Also, what are the long-term health and educational consequences of these sort of mental health issues? And whether the students are going to go back into schools or stay home and do it virtually, this is having a profound impact on students across our country. Uh, Dr. Boyd? This is a great question, Congressman. We're in process of putting some polls in the field, but it's very, very difficult. Um, as I said earlier, uh, there are estimates that could be as many as a third of Title I students people haven't heard from. And uh, so, so knowing exactly what's happening in those households, we don't know. We're hopeful that as schools come back online, you know, after, after this summer break, that they will be able to give us more information. Our fear is that a no we may lose a number of school-based health centers because their sponsoring agency does not have the resources for them to reopen. Um, the impact we believe, along with our colleagues in the school psychologists and, and counseling areas and the nurses are gonna be devastating. And students are going to be typecast when they come back and they show behaviors that to a student going through trauma is actually normal for a person going through trauma but because they're acting out, may then get typecast and put into the system. That's a problem that we're really, really concerned about. And, and I don't think anybody at this point has good solutions to it, but we just frankly don't know what's happening with a lot of kids at home. And, and, and that's where the telehealth opportunity is, is great. And, and support from the FCC would be great to provide those kinds of platforms and resources to, to get out there and find out and communicate with the kids. Thank you, Dr. And also, uh, are, are, are school-based health centers equipped to serve as COVID-19 testing sites? They would be if they had access to the test, yes, sir. Okay, uh, Madam Chair, I yield, thank you. Solomon yields back. Uh, I don't see any other members, so I think that we have heard from uh, subcommittee members from both sides of the aisle, as well as our uh, colleagues that waved on. Um, I have uh, documents to submit to the record, and I see uh, my friend, uh, Mr. Griffith, standing by. I have four pages, so I'd like to ask for a unanimous consent request uh, that um, all of um, uh, the uh, the documents that are contained in this stack be entered into the record. No, no. As long as it's been provided to our committee staff as well, no objection. It it all has. I haven't added anything uh, to what was presented to uh, to the minority staff, and I thank the gentleman 
Let me close on this note. Uh, first of all, uh, our deepest thanks to each one of you. We've been together for three hours and 15 minutes, not that you were counting the, uh, the seconds or the minutes, but boy, was it time well spent. Uh, these are such important programs, and you have taken a very deep dive into why they are so important, how they work, uh, who serves, uh, and really the original motivations uh, for these programs. In the case of Ms. Goodman, uh, Goodman uh, it was uh, the tragedy of losing um, her son. So uh, I, I can't thank you enough for enlightening us. And uh, these reauthorizations are very important. Um, uh, and for the, if anyone's listening in, in the country to this uh, uh, virtual hearing, uh, reauthorization means that we're, going, we're reviewing the program. Um, we uh, may add, we may subtract, but we uh, are uh, renewing the contract on it, so to speak, uh, so that um, uh, it, the program can keep running. So from our children to the diseases that the, the rare diseases that they uh, uh, have to uh, saving lives through uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the donors and the cord blood, uh, to doping and making sure that our sports are absolutely clean uh, to our friend from Harvard, uh, who has offered, um, uh, I think, in a very clear way, uh, what his position is on some of the legislation. I hope I haven't missed anyone, uh, but we appreciate you. We appreciate you and the testimony that you have given. Um, continue to work with us. Um, we always need the expert advice. We're bettered as a result of it. Uh, and with that, uh, I will um, now adjourn the health uh, subcommittee uh, and thank you all for your participation. Committee is adjourned.